So what's going on, our Today All Day friends? We're so happy that you're here because now it is official. It's Friday. Friday. Uh, we got a great show. Told you it was catching on. We have a great show. By the way, if you're just tuning in, let us tell you about Today in 30. It's a showcase of the top segments across all four hours of our show. We do it in 30 minutes because 29 wasn't as catchy. No, no, and look how easy. Bite-sized 30 minutes. So what do you say we get you started, Savannah? We'll start in Miami. The search for survivors in that terrifying building collapsed. We're going to bring you the latest from the scene there. Plus, Craig introduces us to a new police training academy, and it's seeking to create a change from the inside. And then meet the fastest <laughs> woman in America, Shakari Richardson. Remember her name. We're going to talk to her as she gets ready for the Tokyo Olympics. Plus, we're taking you behind the brand of the iconic Highlights for Children magazine and show you some surprising backstories that you do not want to miss. Let's get Get going. It is time Let's for it. Today, Today in, in 30. No, 30. We've got complete coverage this morning. We want to start at the scene. NBC senior national correspondent Tom Yamas is there for us. Tom, good morning. Savannah, good morning to you. We are coming to you live from what remains a very, very active situation. I want to zoom in here so we can show you what's happening exactly this morning. Miami-Dade Fire and Rescue putting water on that mountain of debris right now. And we can't stress enough how dangerous of a situation this is. That debris could shift at any moment. This, as family members tell us overnight, they have received very little information, as others have been asked to provide DNA swabs so they can help identify their loved ones. You're about to hear from P.J. Rod Rodriguez. He believes he lost his mother and his grandmother in this disaster. And he says the night before this happened, his mother told him she had heard very loud noises. It sounded like the building was creaking. This morning, from every angle, desperation and devastation in Surfside. Families searching for answers, first responders searching for signs of life. 99 people still unaccounted for. She was amazing. Um, and then my, my son is, that's the, the hardest part right now. It's, um, he keeps asking me when, when's she coming over because he saw the, the footage this morning. P.J. Rodriguez's mother and grandmother were inside the tower that collapsed. When his family saw this surveillance video showing the catastrophe in real time, they lost all hope. One minute, the building is standing. The next, it's tumbling down into a plume of ash. I think somebody should definitely pay for this. Unfortunately, it happened to... Unfortunately, it happened to my, well, my grandma, but, it, you know, it happened to other families, too. Residents who did make it out alive say it felt like an earthquake. I opened the door and I saw that the building had pancakes in the back. Surfside's mayor in disbelief. We're going to do our very best to save as many people in that pile of rubble as we possibly can. Miami-Dade Fire and Rescue working around the clock from a parking garage underneath the pile cutting tunnels, risking their own lives to try and reach inside. We have teams of firefighters constantly as they continue to making cuts, breaches, and uh, placing uh, sonar devices, uh, search cams to locate victims. Structural engineers embedded with those firefighters to make sure other parts of the building don't collapse. This process is slow and methodical. Uh, you see that every time there's a shift in the, the rubble, some, you know, we have additional rubble that uh, shifts on us. Of the dozens unaccounted for, Luis, Catalina, and Valeria Gomez, all visiting from Colombia. Ray and Mercedes Urguez, whose daughter says they lived in the building for seven years. And Edgar Gonzalez, whose wife and 16-year-old daughter are at Jackson Memorial Hospital. They survived. We spoke to Edgar's best friend outside. If you had a chance to talk to him, what, what would you say? Keep fighting. Keep fighting. You know, I'm holding out hope. I'm praying. The single sign of hope, this boy pulled from the rubble, his body carried by firefighters as he's put on a stretcher, what appears to be a fist bump to the heroes who saved him. 
And we've also learned about another very, very sad story. A group of three grandmothers who were all very close friends had gone out the night before the collapse to an art exhibit here in Miami. They came back because one of the grandmothers had a condo here in Surfside. They decided to overnight. All three of those grandmothers are now missing. And I happen to know this because I grew up with a lot of their families. We went to the same schools, the same church. They are very good families and they are hurting in a major way like all the families out here. We're back with our special series on the future of the force. The events that have led up to today's sentencing of former police officer Derek Chauvin have created many questions about the role that law enforcement plays in society. And this morning we are exploring one of the nation's newest police academies that is setting out to break a lot of barriers. Craig's in Minneapolis with more on this. Hey, Craig, good morning. Hey, guys, good to see you. You know, I'd never seen a police academy like this. Uh, to your point, though, you know, over the last few years, there really have been widespread protests here in Minneapolis, all over the country, calls to defund the police, waves of early retirements by officers. Stepping into this moment are nine students graduating today from the police academy at Lincoln University. It's the first ever at a historically black college or university, and the chief who started it says it's an effort to create the change he wants to see. Hands up! Don't shoot! Hands up! Across the country, voices sharing outrage and frustration in the wake of police violence, calling for a reckoning over how officers protect and serve. One possible solution can be found on a hill overlooking Jefferson City, Missouri. This is Lincoln University an historically black college founded to educate black veterans of the Civil War. The history here at Lincoln is, is so rich. Yes, sir. That like history inspired story. Chief Gary yeah, Hill the, uh, the first officer, and I will to open the first the police officer, academy first, at an HBCU. How did this come to be? So I started calling the contacts that I've made over the last 20 years. People were like, that is a great idea. Why hasn't anyone thought about that? In a building bearing the address 911 and elsewhere, the students do their coursework. Among them is Andre Jefferson. You decided to become a police officer around the same time this country was dealing with the murder of George Floyd, the killing of Breonna Taylor. All of that's happening. And meanwhile, Andre decides, you know what? I want to wear the uniform. Yes, sir. How did you deal with that? I can't let that situation stopped me. People are, you know, I'm gonna lose friends, I'm gonna lose family. You gotta stand for who you are. Go achieve your goals, be who you are, make something out of yourself, prove people wrong. The latest research shows 67% of police officers in the United States are white. Just over 12% are black. That closely mirrors the racial makeup of the general population. But recent data shows that two-thirds of large police departments are whiter than the communities they police. Chief Hill says black officers walk a line between their work and their communities. In some ways, that makes them uniquely qualified to do the job. How is the approach to training at an HBCU, how is it different than it might be at another law enforcement training academy? Our curriculum is the same curriculum that's taught across the state. So there's really not that much different with the exception of the discussions that we have in class. They watch videos of recent high profile episodes searching for meaning, debating how to do better. As you hear the students having these discussions, what are you thinking? Even though the minority of uh, students in this class are white, the majority are black, it's good to see the discussion and the different chain of thoughts that they have. Not everyone sees it the same way. The day we were there, the students put what they'd learned to the test. Chief Hill set up a mock road rage incident. The students didn't know what they were responding to. You were speeding through the light. Hey, how y'all doing? I'm Officer Henderson. It becomes obvious pretty quickly that they are not in the classroom anymore. Okay, one at a time, sir. No, no, listen to me. Andre arrives as backup. Over here, talk to you. Mm -hmm. Together, they managed to separate the enraged drivers. Index, index, in the scenario, in the scenario. When it's over, the chief doesn't sugarcoat the criticism. When we get here and there's chaos going on, what should you have done? Separate. Separate. Did you do that? Yes, sir. But he also works to build up his students. Have faith and confidence in yourself, okay? Because when you get out there and you don't have faith and confidence in yourself, they will know that. I 
guys. What's going on? Tiaja Fairley is next. She's from East St. Louis and says she'd never seen a black female officer growing up. Sorry, what's your name? She kept the fact that she'd entered a police academy a secret from family and friends until recently. During the exercise, she's able to de-escalate the situation. Can you stay right here? I'm going to talk to him. Yeah. We talked to her afterward. I feel like it's just learning how to talk to people. Tiaja now dreams of becoming a homicide detective. You know, I feel like I could be a role model, kind of. Well, I hope to be a role model because I've never seen nothing like this. Calm both the parties down. That's the chief's dream, to put these young people in the driver's seat and guide them to a better future. Stick around because there's much more coming up on Today in 30. I joined Ellen on her set, what's been a difficult year for her personally and for her show. Very few people go through such huge public humiliation. How can I be an example of strength and perseverance if I give up and run away? Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends in today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, oh. Yes, yes, yes. Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Congratulations to Lester Holt, the most trusted TV news anchor in America, on receiving the prestigious Edward R. Murrow Lifetime Achievement Award for a career dedicated to excellence in journalism. I joined Ellen on her set, what's been a difficult year for her personally and for her show. Very few people go through such huge public humiliation. How can I be an example of strength and perseverance if I give up and run away? Right now on NBC News Now. Here in Chicago, about 20,000 middle schoolers returning to school today. They also took advantage of existing vaccine distribution networks throughout Alaska. Turning now to a young athlete who has the world of sports buzzing. Ah, yes. 21-year-old track star Shakari Richardson has already set records. And now as she gets ready for the Tokyo Olympics, it is clear she is just getting started. We are so pumped, man. We get to talk with her live in just a Ooh. minute. But first, Savannah has a little bit more on her rocket ship ride to fame. She is Shakari Richardson, the exuberant and glamorous U.S. sprinter who just clinched her first Olympic spot in the USA track and field trials this week. Richardson's going to Tokyo! Unbelievable. <laughs> the fact that I am an Olympian, no matter what is said or anything, I am an Olympian. The 21-year-old Dallas native won the 100-meter dash with blazing hair and a blazing fast time, 10.86 seconds. She was so dominant on the track, she even pointed at the clock during the last 20 meters of her semifinal heat. She points to the time, 10.65. I just want the world to know that I'm that girl, that every time I step on the track, I'm going to try to do what it is that me, my coach, my support team believe I can do. Yeah! To celebrate her first trip to the Olympics, she ran into the stands and shared a big hug with her grandmother, Betty Harp, a moment even more poignant because she lost her biological mother just the week before. My family has kept me grounded. This year has been crazy for me, going from just last week, losing my biological mother, and I'm still here. Shakari burst onto the stage after winning the 2019 NCAA title as a freshman. And now that she has clinched that Olympic spot, she is, as she says, that girl. Mm. Shakari, Shakari, Shakari. Oh, hey. oh, we want to let you know that we were we made up a little song about you, Shakari. It goes like this. Shakari. Whoa, whoa, whoa. They've been singing it all. Shakari. Whoa, 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 whoa. Shakari, we are proud of you. We are pumped for you. We watched you cross that finish line. And you know what I love about you? The first half of the race, I was a little scared, I have to say. I was like, when are the, when are the ultra jets going to come on? Is that the way you do the first half of the race? The second half is your better half? Oh, wait, 
wait, wait, wait, wait. We can't hear you. Pause, pause. Okay, can we hear Shakira? Are you on mute? We just talked to you. Hang on. Oh, hello. There we go. Okay, try again. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but um, I was saying that, honestly, of course, the end of my race is the better half. Um, me and my coach, we work on that um, a lot. And naturally, I think I get that part more so just genetically. In the beginning of my race, is honestly trial and error. Uh, I have good starts. I have bad starts sometimes. But at the end of the day, it's always an effort and trying. So mm. we're going to always go back to the always work at the beginning of the race. But at the end of the day, we know where, um, where I excel. Mm. And mm. I'm never going to not use that ability, you know, to save myself when I need to. <laughs> Shakira, you gave America a moment. You gave our Instagram feeds a moment. I remember when I saw you, Franklin Instagram, I'm like, who is this girl? Yeah. And then we saw you run up into the stands, oh. hug your grandmother. Take me back to that moment, why it was so important. No one was going to stop you from running up there and giving her that hug. Oh, I hope not, because they would have had a problem. Oh. Uh, <laughs> but no, definitely. Running up into the stands to uh, see my grandmother, I, that moment, I was just so grateful and blessed the fact that she could be there um, from her catching her first flight ever, probably what, two weeks before that. And then again, uh, again on a flight to come and support me in one of the biggest moments of my life. Uh, if it wasn't for her, there I wouldn't even have made it to that moment. So being able to share that moment with her was just literally unbelievable, unforgettable. It probably it, it definitely feels better, almost almost better than uh, getting that medal. <laughs> but um, it made mm. it feel so much sweeter, though, the mm -hmm. fact that she was there. You know, she carry you, you, this year of the pandemic and the the delay, and you know, losing your biological mom. How has that impacted you? All of this, you know, for, in the last year. Oh, um, the pandemic, honestly, mentally, um, physically, emotionally, was definitely a journey for the fact of just not knowing what's going to happen with my career-wise. And then mentally just, um, it being my first, you know, first go-around pretty much mm -hmm. not knowing uh, where I'm going to go. Like, honestly, not knowing uh, if my career was going to even be what we had worked for it to be what we predicted to be so definitely that was a challenge in itself and just going back to losing my mother um recently that was as a, something i wasn't expecting but i feel like from the pandemic itself we wasn't expecting the pandemic so if anything i've taken from the pandemic and i've been able to use in my life it's just stay ready for the unexpected well shakira and you're so, you're a fighter we love you just real quick what color is your hair going to be for the olympics Ooh. Stay tuned. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. A huge lift is underway for one of the most celebrated cities in this country, Cleveland, Ohio. Yep. This is the greatest location in the nation. <laughs> We're having a baby. Wow. The big reveal is under the lid. <laughs> Hey now. Things are looking brighter, so we want to help you find the fun in 21. <laughs> Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring is sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now, it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen.
For generations, kids like myself have <laughs> lost themselves in the pages of Highlights magazine, usually sitting at the dentist's office. <laughs> this was the only thing that would take Made them it horrible, right? Yeah. Well, this morning we're going to take you behind the brand. This month is a special one. Highlights for Children is celebrating its 75th anniversary. And I was so excited to do this story. I sat down with two of the company's leaders who also happened to be descendants of the founders, and they shared a rich history of family, learning, and lots of fun with a purpose. I think the secret is always to look at the world through the kids' eyes. If you've ever waited in the doctor's office, chances are you've seen the bright covers of Highlights magazine and the hidden picture puzzles inside. Like this one, where you might find a lollipop, an ice cream cone, even a toothbrush. But Pat Mickelson knows that there's a lot more to the history of her family's business than pictures. What began as a magazine 75 years ago has expanded across multiple platforms to reach more than 10 million young readers in 40 countries. Can you take me back to the beginning and, and how it all started? It started with my grandparents. Gary Cleveland Myers, a child psychologist, and Caroline Clark Myers, an educator, dreamed of starting a magazine for children. They really wanted to make something that would be very, very special to help children grow. So in 1946, they started Highlights in Honesdale, Pennsylvania. How was it received right off the bat? Within two or three months, they had over 5,000 subscribers. That's going door to door to door because that's the only way that magazines were sold back then. But that success was not without its setbacks. They very quickly found out that creating a magazine could be very expensive. And they really needed to find other ways to get that magazine in the children's hands. They almost went bankrupt. In 1950, the 50 cents per issue publication was on the verge of collapse. So Pat's parents decided to join the company and suggest something new. My parents began to experiment with direct marketing through the mails and through putting it in doctor's offices. Those are the things then that really made highlights grow. Then after 10 successful years came tragedy in December 1960. Two planes collided over New York City and my parents have died in that crash. I mean, how do you move on from that? Not just as a company, but as a family. Any family that's experienced that kind of tragedy will tell you, you just do. You can continue on with this dream. Since then, the company has distributed more than 1.3 billion editions, celebrating every anniversary along the way, from their 10th to their 50th, and now 75th. And leadership remains in the family. The founder's great-grandson, Kent Johnson, is the current CEO. We put love into every page to have the, the, the greatest possible impact on the kid that, that's gonna receive that magazine. The secret is it's really hard work of people who are professionally dedicated to this idea of helping children become their best selves. Highlights also aims to represent all children, from those who wear hijabs to those with same-sex parents. And the magazine is acting as an outlet to help kids understand their world. I remember a, a story from a couple magazines ago about a little girl who had two homes. I've never talked to my son about divorce before. You know, I, I just ha haven't had the need to. And his immediate response is so-and-so in school also has two homes. And it, it just told a, a story to him that was normalized. It's their story that we build empathy for the others around us. Young readers can even send a letter to the staff on any topic that's important to them. Do they all get read or is there just a pile of letters somewhere? <laughs> From the very beginning, every child's letter has been read. That's over 2.5 million. Wow. And ah. counting. Everyone's asleep. Thanks to That's curious slender. kids like my own son, Cal. Right now on NBC News Now. Here in Chicago, about 20,000 middle schoolers returning to school today. They also took advantage of existing vaccine distribution networks throughout Alaska.
The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Our Across America journey Here in Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky. Cleveland. Reporting on an America rebuilding after the pandemic. How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. It's time for today's food, and since we're dedicating this week to making your life easier, we've got a fix-ahead Friday meal that will certainly do the trick. All right, so we cook like to cook on Friday. <laughs> it's our favorite thing to do. Cookbook author and New York Times food columnist Melissa Clark has a tasty Mediterranean meal you can make today and save for tomorrow. So let's get cooking. Grilled yogurt marinated chicken with herbs is the perfect thing to make ahead because the longer it marinates, the better it tastes and the more flavorful it gets. So we're gonna start out with chicken thighs. Um, these are boneless, skinless chicken thighs. You could use breasts if you want. Just when you cook them, they tend to cook a little more quickly, so you wanna watch them. And I'm gonna marinate the thighs in yogurt. This is chopped oregano, lemon zest, lots and lots of garlic because you need lots of garlic anytime you grill chicken. It's the law. I'm adding a special herb today. I've got za'atar. So za'atar is the name for a Middle Eastern herb. It's also the name for an herb mixture that's made from this herb. And it kind of tastes like oregano or marjoram. It also has sesame in it and sumac, which gives it a great acidity. So I'm gonna add all of that to the chicken. First thing I'm gonna do is um, season my chicken with a little bit of salt and pepper. Now the thing about a yogurt marinade is that it's so great because it tenderizes a chicken. It makes the flesh so juicy and you can do it ahead. So you just do this the day before. The next day when you're ready to grill, it is waiting for you. I've used whole milk yogurt, but you can also use low fat if you prefer. The only thing is don't let it marinate for more than 24 hours because after that it tends to get a little mushy. So 24 hours is your sweet swap. So stir that together, add your za'atar. And I'm gonna add some chopped up cilantro. You could also use basil, or dill, any kind of fresh herbs. You just want it for the brightness. And a little bit of olive oil, which is important when you're grilling, you always need to use some kind of oil so it doesn't stick to the grill. And you wanna let that marinate for a minimum of two hours in the fridge. So I made this earlier today, and now I'm gonna throw it on the grill. This is one of those dishes that once you make it you know, you make it the first time according to the recipe, and after that, you just do your own thing. It is extremely adaptable. Which means you can have this one recipe, cook it all summer long, and no one will know it's actually the same recipe. Boneless chicken cooks really quickly, so that's gonna be done in under 20 minutes. And while it's cooking, I'm just gonna make a little sauce. So what I have here, I have yogurt, it's the same yogurt that I used to marinate the chicken and that's gonna be the basis of the sauce. And I have more garlic, to just grate it up. Lemon zest, pepper, and a little bit of salt. And that's it, that's the sauce. And what the sauce does it, is it amplifies the flavors that are already in the marinade. I'm gonna flip it. And 20 minutes later, ta-da! How easy is that? It is cooked perfectly. It is nice and brown on the outside. I've sprinkled a little bit more of the cilantro on top. I'm just gonna finish it with a squeeze of lemon and a little drizzle of olive oil. And you have your summer grilled chicken dish. You can serve it again and again. I'm gonna eat this right now. Happy weekend, everybody. See you. I love Mediterranean. Yummy. And we love Melissa, too. To mm. get her recipe, head to today.com slash food. Okay, Hoda, so what do you fix ahead on Fridays? You know what I fix ahead on Fridays? Crushed ice, okay? Okay. A little uh, 1942 tequila. Okay. Okay. 
I will never make meatloaf on Friday. <laughs> Nobody's freezing it and saving it for Sunday. Because Friday is the official beginning of the weekend. You don't make things on Friday. You sip things. Friday is a sipping day. You sip baby sips all the way to Sunday. Well, we sure hope you're with us for another huge week on today. Hoda, I, I don't know. I, the, mm. Monday can't get here fast enough. You are going to be interviewing the newly minted U.S. Olympic gymnastics team. I'm going to be decked out in my Olympic gear as if I'm one of them. All right, we're going to see you Monday morning right here on today. Have a great weekend. for joining us on today all day over in the next 30 minutes I'll share some of my favorite interviews with you these conversations include interviews with inspiring women chatting all things books with a few of my favorite authors and of course some funny moments in between so sit back and relax as today all day continues I'm Jenna Bush Hager and I'm here with Brandy Carlisle who has written a new beautiful memoir called Broken Horses. Brandy, to write a memoir is like a, a major thing, right? Because you're putting out all, a lot of you. You're telling these stories that maybe you only told yourself. What was the process like? It was kind of quick because for me, it was like a stream of consciousness, you know? I was starting to find myself wanting to write more when I would finish a song, but I would go, okay, well, you know, it has to be three and a half minutes and, you know, I should stop writing. And so, um, you know, one day I sort of just didn't stop. Now, what was the difference? So you are the songwriter and prolific one at that. Um, what, what was the difference in process? Where did you write? Do you write sort of in the same way as when you write your songs as you did this memoir? I think that the big, biggest difference is that, um, I can't wrap anything in metaphor. You know what I mean? There's like, and I can, I can get poetic sometimes and I can play with words a little bit, but for the most part, I just had to sort of tell the truth. Although I was just about to ask you about the metaphor of broken horses. So I guess there's some metaphor still left. I managed know, like... a couple of them. There, yeah. <laughs> Talk about that, about the title. Well, it's, it is a metaphor, but it's also very literal, you know? My daughter, Evangeline, she's seven. She's my greatest teacher and my arch nemesis and best friend. She uh, was curled up in bed with me and Catherine one morning while we were discussing the title of the book because we didn't have one. And there was a working title and I was starting to hate it. And uh, so we were discussing titles and we were talking about the themes in the book and um, me growing up poor came up in the conversation. And Evangeline's been asking for a pony or a horse since damn near since she could talk. And I've always told her, I'm like, no, horses are expensive. Like, you're not getting a horse until you can have a responsibility and work to support it and all these different soapbox lines. <laughs> and so she's, she hears this whole thing about me, me growing up poor. And she says, so wait, mom, you said that you, when you grew up, you were poor. And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, but you had two horses. Well, I was given broken ones. And she goes, huh. You should call your book Broken Horses. It, it exploded into a cacophony of, of metaphors, many of them for myself, mm -hmm. for people that I try to bring into my music and life, and also for um, just the, the unbrokenness of those majestic creatures sort of paralleling. Well, now, now, are you getting our horse? <laughs> no. There's been talk of, of uh, two horses, um, one for... <laughs> One for me and one for her at some point. In your book, you write about, I mean, it starts with a sickness, you know, with you and a coma. It starts with the fact that you had meningitis as a little girl. Did you find comfort in books? Oh, yeah. I was a reading fool. That is something that I just did all the time. I was always under the covers with a flashlight reading books. I read every boxcar children, everything in the babysitter's club, all the scary too. Books, the goosebumps, stories to tell in the dark. And I started getting into you too. Yeah, I think we're about this. We must be similar age because that was all my Those reading your, That's your jam. Yeah, yeah. Are you, are you 40? I'm turning 40. Yeah. Same. Same, Same age. 
so those were my books and I was so into them. And then I hit um, 11 years old and I, I fell in love with Elton John over a fifth grade book report. I read a book about a boy who died of AIDS, Ryan White. Yeah, um, in I read that book. And I'm this 12 year old little girl. I read it. And through that book, I discovered Bowie and Elton and the Beatles, U2, George Michael and Freddie Mercury. And that changed my life. Before that, I was just a, a country singer, a little kid who's a country singer. And so books, I think books have given me uh, pretty much most of what I am. And, and uh, I owe them a lot. I know Cormac McCarthy was a... Um an inspiration to you, not only in, in that you loved his books, but also in songwriting. Talk about other authors that have inspired. Well, Cormac McCarthy, he can write some really, really dark stuff too. I think it can really be beautiful, lend itself to Americana songs. So early on in my writing, it really influenced my, my writing. And then in terms of intellectually and spiritually stimulating writers, I've been really influenced by Tara Westover, who wrote mm -hmm. Educated. Have you read that? Yeah, I love I love oh. that book. So I, I felt really inspired by Educated and the fact that I struggled with an education, you know, yeah. my whole life. I failed out of everything and then finally dropped out of high school early uh, in my sophomore year. So I think it's fascinating when people overcome these monumental you know, seemingly insurmountable obstacles to do amazing things. I mean, she has a PhD. I still don't even have a high school diploma or even a GED, but I feel smarter having written, written the book and um, it's done a lot for me. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines, so crucial for reopening America. A big day around here, a very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Our week-long journey begins here in Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky. In Cleveland. Our Across America journey, reporting on an America rebuilding and reimagining a future after the pandemic. Breaking news tonight, the ceasefire in the Middle East after 11 days of deadly violence. Richard Engel is on the ground. Do you think there's a connection between policing and racism? How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nike News with Lester Holt. I was going to say it must have been liberating in some ways to write, not only because you're sh sharing your story, which is empowering in itself, but also for someone who dropped out of school where you a soft 16, a sophomore in and, and high school, to then write a beautiful memoir is like, okay, well, let's take that to the high school class. You know, like, there's <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, you know, the thing about my schooling is like my teachers lord did they try they tried so hard and i just couldn't for some reason um learn in in that environment and there was nothing wrong with the environment and um i'll, I'll just never forget how much public school tried and i'll never blame that system for me not being able to finish there was just something about my mind and how i was growing that couldn't apply myself at that time but I'm making up for lost time now and uh, even though I didn't have finished my education I'm proud of the of the little one that I did have yeah and the continuation of it like you're still curious and learning every single day it seems and um, so what what are some of your favorite books and I know you live on kind of a compound with a lot of different people in your family and the people you love do y'all share books do you um, is that part of the culture there? 
Oh yeah, we have all been passing around Untamed by Glennon Doyle. We all love that book. Um, me when Elton put it out. Uh, more myself when Alicia put Alicia Keys put hers out. Velvet Elvis by Rob Bell was hugely uh, spiritually affirming for me. And then Ragamuffin Gospel by Brennan Manning is probably my favorite and most inspirational book that I think I've I've ever read. You know, and I love the term ragamuffin, you know, because I don't think there's ever been a word that describes me or my kind more. <laughs> what about with your kids? Do you read to them? Are there favorite books in y'all's home? Oh, yeah. We've got The Very Hungry Caterpillar. We've got Mommy, Mama, and Me is a big one. Both my kids can recite that uh, uh -oh. lo long before the Pledge of Allegiance. They can recite <laughs> Mommy, Mama, and Me. I read that the Bible is the most formative book in your life. Um, I wonder how many times have you read it and what, like, for, for what reasons uh, do you find strength in it? Well, I've read sections of it thousands of times, and um, but the whole thing, once. And I read it because I was afraid of it. The beautiful thing about that is that I find that if you ever want to get past something that scares you, you kind of have to get closer to it. And so I decided to go in to the Bible instead of stay away from it. And I gave myself a year, but it turned into two years, of Bible study to where I started in the Old Testament. And every section, every chapter I finished, I would read a book by a, an inspirational uh, Christian writer that I was I was fond of, not necessarily even aligned with some of these folks. I didn't see eye to eye on everything, but their interpretations of what I had just read were important to me in that way. You need to publish somehow what you did, because now I'm desperate to do that study. What you read, your, your, your extra reading, like the books you read on top of reading the Bible, I feel like you need to put that out there somewhere. I mean, I could tell you, so Peter uh, Gnomes, The Good Book, Rachel Held, Ever Held Evans, Rob Bell, Velvet Elvis, Love Wins, Sex God, Brennan Manning, All is Grace, The Signature of Jesus, Regamuffin Gospel, uh, on and on and on. Thank you so much, Brandy. This was so awesome. I'm like, I'm now I'm like writing it frantically down. You should see my writing everywhere. You should see the, thank you for that. I think that's such a cool way to study the Bible. So interesting. Thank you so much. the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. right. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. A huge lift is underway for one of the most celebrated cities in this country, Cleveland, Ohio. Yes. This is the greatest location in the nation. <laughs> We're having a baby. Wow. The big reveal is under the lid. <laughs> hey, now. Things are looking brighter, so we want to help you find the fun in 21. <laughs> Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. Your latest novel is being turned into all adults here into a television show. We're working on it. Are you working on it? You're writing it? I'm I'm writing it and 
we'll see. Um, Apple bought it, and so now that's um, amazing. Yeah, I mean, we'll see. You know, I, I, I think I don't. Maybe yeah, I'm, I'm, supposed to I'm knocking. On, I'm knocking on something because <laughs> I have it right here, a wooden desk. This is Open Book with Jenna Bush Hager, and I'm so happy. I have my friend Emma Straub. She has her book, All Adults Here. It's out in paperback. Emma, have you ever been asked the question if there's one classic that you haven't read that you feel guilty about? Do you ever hear that as a writer? People ask me that so often, and I think that they expect me to like, you know, sheepishly be like, Moby Dick or whatever. That's exactly no. what I was thinking. But, but the truth is, no, no, no. I think that I am lucky that there are books that I just haven't had the moment to read yet because that means I get to read them now as a 40 year old and not as like an 18 year old who was maybe assigned it for a class or something. You know, I think that, I think that if we can take shame out of, of reading, we would all be so much happier. But will you read Moby Dick ever? That's the question. Sure, sure. Maybe. You're gonna read Moby Dick? It's entirely possible, Jen. Okay, I'd like you to email me with the book report. Now, now look, I'm shaming you. I, 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 when you asked that question, Moby Dick was what came to my mind, because I'm like, I'm not, and it's referenced so much, and my oldest daughter was like, well, what's Moby Dick about? And I'm like, hmm, it's about a whale. Uh, it's an epic, you know, but she's like, you haven't read it, have you? And I was like, nope. <laughs> and I'll just go ahead and state it here. I don't think I ever will. And you know what? That's fine too. <laughs> okay. Your dad is a writer. He writes mysteries and suspense horror books. Well, did you read any of your dad's work? Is it, <laughs> is it, were you horrified? <laughs> were you scared? Um, you know, I, I wish I could explain it. Like, I wish I could... I wish I could go back in time and see it because I remember taking one of my dad's books um, called Coco, which was published, I think in 1990, which was when I was 10 years old. I remember bringing a, like a little mass market paperback of that to summer camp with me. And this book, I mean, it's like, it is dark. It is pitch black dark. <laughs> I just remember being like, being <laughs> in my little bunk, like just happy as a clam. I wanted to see what he did, you know? I wanted to experience it. And um, so yeah, I started reading his books when I was very young. Um, and I, th I mean, I think, I think about this a lot because, you know, obviously I, like my dad, am now a writer with kids. And uh, I think that I, I understood my dad a lot through reading his books, mm -hmm. not, not because like, not because they were all personal or, or autobiographical, but just because I could see what he was, I wanted to see what he was thinking about. Um, and I hope that my, that my kids someday will, will have that sort of experience reading my books too. So you love to read. It was part of your everyday. And I think you said something that I think is so true. It was like, and I think this goes with the shame. You have this new blog, which I'm obsessed with. I'm giving it to everybody called Reading is Magic. And um, and you said that that it was just part of like your DNA. You saw your parents read. It wasn't pushed on you in a way that felt like severe and that you said that that's not the way to do it. But was there a book that made you want to write? Well, I think I think the books that, that made me want to write were, were probably the mysteries. Um, like when I was maybe in like, say, say like fourth to sixth grade, like that kind of like you see like scholastic book fair zone, you know? I was reading like Christopher Pike and Lois Duncan and like Nancy Drew and all of those books. So, but now will you ever write a mystery? Like do you have that dark side in you somewhere that could use or not really? No. Well, you know, it's funny. I mean, so right now I am I am really close to finishing a draft of a new novel. And I mean, I'm at this point now where I don't know if it's any good yet. I don't, you know, it's not, I mean, it's sort of in pieces, um, but it's, 
it's a it's time travel it's a time travel book and it's it's a lot about new york city in the 1990s which is you know when i was a teenager and so it's i mean it's 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 darker it's darker than my than my previous books but it's it's still not a heist it's still just about like love <laughs> you're like it's darker but it's not really your latest novel is being turned into all adults here into a television show we're working on it are you working on it you're writing it i'm i'm writing it and we'll see um apple bought it and so now that's um, amazing yeah i mean we'll see you know i i, I think i don't maybe yeah, I'm, not, to to I'm knocking on, i'm knocking on something because <laughs> i have it right here a wooden desk but now so you're working on it do you have dreams um, actors for to play these roles oh man I mean with so you know Astrid Astrid is my favorite character to like pretend cast because you know she's in her late 60s and I just think about like, all these amazing yes. women like, like like Holland Taylor yes Gorney like Weaver or Meryl Streep or you know, they're just yes. there's so many women of, of of that generation who are just perfect Incredible. And, and who I could watch all day, yeah. you know? I so, was thinking Diane Keaton. I'm not sure why, but I just think she would, right? Any, they would, so, so you don't get to actually cast it, do you? No. You're writing it for them. I don't get to do anything. <laughs> what are your favorite books that you would recommend that everybody, and I know, listen, it's not Moby Dick. There's no shame in that. But yeah. what is something you feel like everybody should read before they're before they die? Okay. Whew. Oh man, that's hard. I know. It's hard. Okay. I, I'll, let me let me think of a few. I guess uh, Middlemarch, George Eliot. That is one. That is a classic that to me is a hundred percent worth every minute you spend reading it. Pride and Prejudice. I would say. Yeah, but but then there I mean there are so many there are so many newer books too. Oh god. I mean, yeah. I, I so but some of them are silly. You know, I like I'm like I feel like you know, if you never read any David Sedaris essays, your life would be just a little bit less funny. You know the book you picked that that I think I would put on my like everyone should read it is the Kevin Wilson Oh, I love that nothing, book. Nothing to see here. I can't get over that book. I think that the reason that it's that it resonates to, you know, sort of across the like parental line is because it's it's about a woman who sort of finds herself in charge of these kids. You know, it's not it's not it's not the the story which I am very interested in, but not everyone is, of of a mother who's like oh god. He is such a brilliant writer. I know. Well, should we just leave it with that? All right. Always a pleasure, Jenna. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Emma. Bye, everybody. Congratulations to Lester Holt, the most trusted TV news anchor in America, on receiving the prestigious Edward R. Murrow Lifetime Achievement Award for a career dedicated to excellence in journalism. Right now on NBC News Now, They've done things like installing cameras to help alert Border Patrol to people crossing. They are escaping a number of conditions there, of uh, violence and persecution in their home countries. Right now on NBC News Now. Here in Chicago, about 20,000 middle schoolers returning to school today. They also took advantage of existing vaccine distribution networks throughout Alaska. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends in today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, oh. Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Tonight, the CDC's new outdoor mask guidelines. What changed that allowed this new recommendation to be made? If we do nothing, what happens to a city like Houston? You're going to repeat this movie over and over again. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. 
it's so important um, to, uh, to, to feel like you are represented out there. You, you don't have to be made fun of. You know, you can have a wonderful life and be, you know, very well off and have a loving home. But if you're not seeing yourself represented, that's a message that, that is sending, that is being sent to you that's saying you don't kind of count. So it's, it's very important. This is Jenna Bush Hager and welcome to Open Book. I'm so excited to have uh, someone I really admire, my friend Tay Diggs with me to talk about his new book, My Friend, which is a book that I think every kid should read. It's so much fun. Tay, when you were young, did you think like, okay, I'm gonna write picture books. Was this something you thought you would do? <laughs> no, no, not at all. Uh, and, and Shane, uh, the, the illustrator and one of my best friends and the, and the kind of co-writer of this book, it was his idea when I was much younger. Uh, I would dabble in, in poetry and he thought that uh, that some of the poetry would make a really good, would make really good children's books. So then we just, uh, we started and, and here we are. I think yeah. there's something really beautiful about a friendship, a partnership that inspires, you know, somebody that 100%. says like we can create together. What 100%. is that? Yeah, yeah what's yeah. that been like? It's been awesome. You know, a lot of people say you never should work with friends and in, in, a, in a lot of a lot of cases that's true. But with us, it's the kind of relationship where we have this shorthand where he's so amazing at what he does and he has this trust with, with what I do that uh, this is like our fourth or fifth book together. Your books have always talked about diversity, Has have always mm -hmm. talked about being enough. How mm -hmm. important is representation? So important in, in all of the Black Lives Matter, with all of that, it's, it's obvious that we're kind of going through that, but it's something that we've we've needed to to realize for quite some time. Growing up, it was something that, that I struggled with. Uh, I have a child that's biracial, and it's something I'm constantly, you know, making sure that he's aware you know, that he is enough and that regardless of of what other people think, you know, he has that that power within himself to, to know that, you know, he's all right. It uh, doesn't matter how you look or how much money you have or who your friends are. That uh, that 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 kind of power needs to come from within. So yeah, it's a, me a message that is that is very important now and has been and continues to be. Yeah, um, I I just um, have been reading Toni Morrison, and one of the oh, things wow. she said is that you know when she was younger and she was a reader an avid mm -hmm. reader. You know, some of the books that were assigned to her in school didn't show anybody that looked like her. You know, there was yeah. nothing that resembled her life in the pages of what she read. Mm -hmm. What about when you were young? Did you did you find yourself in books? And, and what books moved you? My family growing up, everybody, we would buy each other greeting cards. And in the greeting cards, it was very rarely that they, they were the characters in the greeting cards looked like me. So my father would color in the, uh, the the characters in the greeting card so that they look chocolate. And that's where the, the term chocolate meat comes from. So to answer your question, no, there were not a lot of books that had characters that looked like me. My mother scoured the earth uh, uh, to find them. Um, there was a book named Corduroy, where they had a little black girl who finds this little uh, bear that has a missing button. And she, you know, she nobody wants to buy the bear because it's got a missing button. She buys the bear and, and the bear is at home. Um, that was a great book, uh, uh, and then there was uh, a book called Snowy Day, about a little a little brother that uh, enjoys the snow. So, the books were few and far between. It's changed. Uh, we still need to 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 do better, but it's 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 a lot better right now. And uh, and Shane and I, we feel so lucky to be just to be a part of that. What about your son is now, I think, probably reading to himself, but. Yeah, yeah, he is, he is. <laughs> do y'all talk about books and do you remember reading to him as a little as a little boy? He loves to read, so, you know, that that was awesome. So it's great that he get, he actually, the, 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 the last thing that I, that I read, that I wrote, I asked him to kind of proofread for me and uh, and I got his sample approval. So it's it's been great and he's, he's 11 now, so, we can actually have real discussions. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's been really, really cool. You said, and I, I read in an interview, which I think a lot of people can relate to, that mm -hmm. books were a made for your best friends before you had siblings. Sure, <laughs> you, sure. Yeah. Do you was, still uh, find solace in reading? It helped me become uh, an actor. You know what I mean? Just the, the idea of being able to escape uh, whatever was going on in my life 
um, as dramatic as it sounds. I could read and that immediately became my life. So um, books are way, way more important than, than, uh, than, than I kind of uh, sometimes uh, take the time to realize. Is there one to start off this new year, is there one book you would recommend to everybody besides my friend? <laughs> People are gonna get so mad. But Chelsea Handler, I've been reading a lot of Chelsea Handler <laughs> and David Sedaris. Um, those, those those are the last two. Listen, I love Chelsea Handler. She's one of my favorites. What about the most, the most impactful? Let's end with that. Something that, that both oh. it. Probably the autobiography of Malcolm X. Yeah, my professors are looking down and smiling on me. Yeah, that <laughs> one. Yeah, that was that was probably the most impactful. Where, as a young man growing up, realized, oh, the world the world is is this way as opposed to that way. Yeah. Today, all day. It's almost the weekend, and we've got a great show for you. So let's kick it off with pop culture news we all need to know. Take a look. Before she rocks Rockefeller Plaza, here's a closer look at her remarkable rise to stardom. We made it. It has been a massive year for her. And the Grammy goes to. And the Oscar goes to her. The singer songwriter taking home two Grammy Awards, including Song of the Year. I've never been so proud to be an artist. And an Academy Award for Best Original Song. I am so, 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 so grateful. On top of performing at the Super Bowl. Her stands for having everything revealed. But before she was an award-winning recording artist, she was a young rising star performing right here on Today when she was just 10 years old. You may not have heard of her until this moment, but I promise you that after she performs, you will not forget her. Everything's gonna be all right. Not only did they not forget, but hers music has been streamed more than six billion times. So now she's out with her first full-length album, Back of My Mind, as we welcome her back to today on our city concert stage. Britney Spears' legal fight to end her conservatorship and, as she says, really just take back her life. That's right, Britney Spears posting for the first time on social media yesterday since her explosive testimony, writing to fans, I apologize for pretending like I've been okay the past two years. I did it because of my pride, and I was embarrassed to share what happened to me. New York Times senior editor, story editor, and co-creator of Framing Britney Spears documentary, Liz Day, joins us now for a deeper dive into what's next. Liz, good morning to you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. We just saw that that Instagram post that she posted yesterday, pretending, um, as she said, that everything w was OK. Tell me this. I guess it actually helped her as an outlet to share her existence. She talked about that. What did you make of that after everything that we learned on Wednesday, the fact that she would get back on Instagram and, and try to, to speak on her own? I thought that was really interesting. As you noted, she said that pretending everything was OK really helped her feel better. And she even made a joke, you know, saying who doesn't use their Instagram for making their life seem better than it really is. And we don't know exactly what's going on with her Instagram, whether she's always writing the captions. But it'll be interesting to see moving forward whether it starts to be more open about what's really going on with her life. So, so Liz, you know, we've been hearing about this uh, and you've been reporting on the f hashtag free Britney movement for a while now. So. So do you, how much do you think that this groundswell has led to where we are right now? I think a lot. And I think they really feel vindicated because for a long time they've been trying to shine a spotlight on, you know, whether Britney is doing OK and also the conservatorship system at large. And they've been dismissed as conspiracy theories. So I think to hear uh, from Britney directly uh, validating a lot of what they were saying is uh, really powerful. And I think hearing Brittany actually come out and speak publicly, I mean, it seemed like she was just sort of squeezing everything that's been happening in the past several years into, you know, these four pages that she was reading from. I mean, how, how important do you think it was for everyone else to hear from her, you know, and, and just to hear it in her own words? 
I think it was really powerful. One of the most wrenching things she said in court was that she's never spoken about this because she didn't think people would believe her. Mm. So to see the like groundswell of support from the general public and even celebrities like Andy Cohen or Justin Timberlake, I think uh, may actually really help. What about on the other side of this, her father, Jamie Spears, we know he released a brief statement during the hearing saying that he was, quote, sorry to see his daughter suffering and in so much pain and that he loves Brittany and her sister. But since then, he's declined to comment. What do you think is happening on that side of this? And we haven't heard from her family as well. Yeah, it's been interesting that, you know, we haven't heard much from the family um, and that may change. We don't really know. You know, Jamie Spears, her father, has long said that he loves his daughter and that he is only acting out of her best interest. But experts point out that there's a conflict of interest when he makes money off of the conservatorship. So if he signs up for her to do a deal, is it because he uh, it's in her best interest or is it because he can get a percentage of that multimillion dollar deal? Mm. And, and Liz, you know, through your reporting, you've glimpsed inside her world. Whether this conservatorship ends or not, how, how does this impact her career and really her personal life? Because forget about the career, forget about all this other stuff. This is a person, you know, that we're talking about uh, and not just a, you know, a, a, an entity. Yeah, I think it's hard to know what's going on inside the head of the judge or the other lawyers, but I think that hearing the power of emotion and hearing directly from Brittany really raises the stakes in this case. So it's not just about, you know, the nuance of the law and kind of wonky stuff like that. It's really more powerful and emotional than that. Absolutely. We'll certainly continue to follow this one. Liz, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. Coming up next on Today Talks, a major milestone for the iconic children's magazine, Highlights. Don't go away. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. (laughs) Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. (laughs) And important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to Today. Future's looking bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. (laughs) Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Our Across America journey here in Louisville, Kentucky. Cleveland, reporting on an America rebuilding after the pandemic. How narrow of a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Welcome back. Today in the third hour, we're celebrating the 75th anniversary of everybody's favorite magazine, Highlights, the playful, fun, and smart kids magazine. Take a look. For generations, kids like myself have lost themselves in the pages of Highlights magazine, usually sitting at the dentist's office. <laughs> this was the only thing that would take the right? Well, this morning we're going to take you behind the brand. This month is a special one. Highlights for Children is celebrating its 75th anniversary. And I was so excited to do this story. I sat down with two of the company's leaders who also happened to be descendants of the founders, and they shared a rich history of family, learning, and lots of fun with a purpose. I think the secret is always to look at the world through the kids' eyes. If you've ever waited in the doctor's office, chances are you've seen the bright covers of Highlights magazine and the hidden picture puzzles inside. Like this one, where you might find a lollipop, an ice cream cone, even a toothbrush. But Pat Nicholson knows that there's a lot more to the history of her family's business than pictures. What began as a magazine 75 years ago has expanded across multiple platforms to reach more than 10 million young readers in 40 countries. Can you take me back to the beginning and and how it all started? It started with my grandparents. 
Gary Cleveland Myers, a child psychologist, and Caroline Clark Myers, an educator, dreamed of starting a magazine for children. They really wanted to make something that would be very, very special to help children grow. So in 1946, they started Highlights in Honesdale, Pennsylvania. How is it received right off the bat? Within two or three months. They had over 5,000 subscribers. That's going door to door to door because that's the only way that magazines were sold back then. But that success was not without its setbacks. They very quickly found out that creating a magazine could be very expensive and they really needed to find other ways to get that magazine in the children's hands. They almost went bankrupt. In 1950, the 50 cents per issue publication was on the verge of collapse. So Pat's parents decided to join the company and suggest something new. My parents began to experiment with direct marketing through the mails and through putting it in doctor's offices. Those are the things then that really made highlights grow. Then, after 10 successful years, came tragedy in December 1960. Two planes collided over New York City, and my parents have died in that crash. I mean, how do you move on from that, not just as a company, but as a family? Any family that's experienced that kind of tragedy will tell you, you just do. You can continue on with this dream. Since then, the company has distributed more than 1.3 billion editions, celebrating every anniversary along the way, from their 10th to their 50th, and now 75th. And leadership remains in the family. The founder's great-grandson, Kent Johnson, is the current CEO. We put love into every page to have the, the, the greatest possible impact on the kid that, that's going to receive that magazine. The secret is it's really hard work of people who are professionally dedicated to this idea of helping children become their best selves. Highlights also aims to represent all children, from those who wear hijabs to those with same-sex parents. And the magazine is acting as an outlet to help kids understand their world. I remember a, a story from a couple magazines ago about a little girl who had two homes. I've never talked to my son about divorce before. You know, I, I just ha haven't had the need to. And his immediate response is so-and-so in school also has two homes. And it, it just told a, a story to him that was normalized. It's their story that we build empathy for the others around us. Young readers can even send a letter to the staff on any topic that's important to them. Do they all get read or is there just a pile of letters somewhere? <laughs> From the very beginning, every child's letter has been read. That's over 2.5 million. Wow. And counting. Everyone's asleep. Thanks to That's curious so kids like my own son, Cal. Oh, we read it. Like, as soon as it comes in the mail, we read it every night at dinner. It just become, became his, his favorite thing. Um, so today, get this, yes. Highlights has hidden more than 2,000 oh. pencils oh. and bananas I and toothbrushes across nearly 10,000 hidden picture puzzles. And take a look at this one. They designed a special one oh. just for us. So you want to head to our Instagram page at Third Hour Today to see if you can find all of the images inside. I've started to look, and I'm, oh. I'm like, I don't... I don't see a few. So. In, in this issue, they've got dad's jokes. Oh, uh, that's do, you. Do, you. Do you know what dinosaurs used to make hot dogs? No, what? Jurassic pork. <laughs> but oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> You got laughter That's so from old, everyone. I fell off my dinosaurs. You, you've got so material good. for oh, days now. I, I oh my do, gosh! I could do a whole, a whole magazine of these. No, to bring this full circle, and, and before we move on, the fact that you read it as a child for me, it changed my life in my grandpa's right. uh, doctor's office. For you, and now you're reading it to Calvin. I mean, it just goes to show. Mm -hmm. um, anyway. It's it's got staying power. Yeah. It is. Yeah. All right. I could do without the timber toes, though. Uh, which I which loved. Oh my gosh. Coming up on Hoda and Jenna, things get a little heated as we debate the right way to fold towels. That's just ahead. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. <laughs> Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. 
Are you ready? Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. A huge lift is underway for one of the most celebrated cities in this country, Cleveland, Ohio. Yes. This is the greatest location in the nation. <laughs> We're having a baby. Wow. The big reveal is under the lid. <laughs> Hey now. Things are looking brighter, so we want to help you find the fun in 21. <laughs> Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Ready actors. An indie horror film, a talented young actress, and a deadly shot. Dateline's newest podcast, Killer Roll. Action! Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. Welcome back. Today on Hoda and Jenna, apparently there's a correct way to fold towels. And we discuss all the details. Plus, one of our favorites, Jamie Lee Curtis, is here to talk about her latest project, a podcast. Take a look. Big weekend for a lot of folks. It's the Daytime Emmy Awards. <laughs> you know what's so funny? We're nominated for a yes. Daytime Emmy um, <clears throat> with a whole bunch of other really more qualified shows than ours. But no, our show, our show is qualified. We're definitely qualified. But it's so funny, the, these kind of award things, because, you know, sometimes, like, you just, you, it would be super fun to win. But a lot of times, but mostly you, you don't. don't. Uh, no, and I've been to so many of these awards ceremonies where, because I, you know, it's like you're nominated for like a Dateline story in yes. an Emmy category, and you're like this, <laughs> and the winner is you're like, somebody else from 60 Minutes. You're like, oh my God, good for you, Leslie Stoll. Oh, I knew you were gonna get. It. I loved your story, but inside you're like, boy. Oh, I thought ours was and you know good. what? It's like I, I haven't ever been to that many award uh -huh, shows, uh -huh. but you all have that moment going back to like elementary school yep. when it's like, and the homecoming queen is <laughs> not you weren't even nominated. You know what I mean? There is such Although a you feeling. you were the homecoming well, queen. But that was by you default. You usually win. No, that, no, I actually I don't. I think you're going to no. give us a good shot. No, but here's the funny thing. It is funny, though, when you think it might be you and you're almost, have you ever been like almost out yes. of your chair? Yes. You're like, and the most likely to succeed for the class of 1987 <laughs> is, and you're like, no, your no. jolliest job. You need to sit back down. That's your superlative. It's so but funny. No, it's, and to have that gracious face, too, yeah. which is sort of like. But, I mean, think about, like, the Susan Lucci's who every year yes. were nominated and didn't get it until finally. And I just think it's, there's something. Are you something. saying that's going to be us? Well, we could be the Susan <laughs> Lucci of the Emmys. But we're all, we're, by the way, it's like one of those things. We really, I think the good thing is never to really expect you're going to get anything. Yes. And Lower usually. your expectations and drink more. Yes. <laughs> right? Yes. Yes. So that's what we'll be doing Friday. All right. Okay. Um, we know that we started a huge Spanx debate. It really sweeps the nation. And the good news is I won the debate, and I don't win very much, okay? But there's a new debate that's lighting up social media, and it has to do with towels. How to fold them. All right. So, oh, we each have a towel. Here's yours. Okay. There you go, miss. Here's mine. So okay. we are going to show you how we fold a towel. Everyone has their own way of doing it. Can it so, I, so I actually stand I up. I stand up. Okay. I think I go like this. And I, I think I fold under it my long chin, ways. Like this. This is how my and mom taught me. And I just pop it over. And I do this. Then I go like this. And then I do and this. Up. But actually, this is not looking good. Do you do it too? Oh, you go. I go. Why do you do that? I don't know. Because well, fold it in half. My mother taught me it. this because I think it looks a lot oh, neater. So it's crisper. Crisp. Oh, I actually like that. Right? Mm hmm. That's good. Okay, mine's bigger. And yes, it is. But it's floppy. Okay, insta so here, here we go. <laughs> Let's find out the right way to fold a towel. Chelsea Handler posted this on Instagram. These are the different ways. Oh, yeah, I'm number one. And I'm number two. Way. And I'm number, number two. two. And nobody's number three. So Jennifer Gardner grew up a two, but has now grown to appreciate a three. Rolling them up? Kevin Bacon and Drew Barrymore both went with one. Yes, thank you, Drew and Kevin. 
And luckily, Uzo Adubo went with two or three. She writes, I will die here. Um, and Jesse Tyler Ferguson actually agrees with me, Hoda, and says only a straight man would find one acceptable. <laughs> I think I might be a straight man. <laughs> the way I load the dishwasher and fold things. You really do. You have, I, I you have, have all straight those man tendencies. energy. I actually showed Joel, there was a video of someone saying, is this a proper way to load a dishwasher? And it was all messed up with like stuff jammed in. Just as long as you can shut it and put the soap in. It's no, good. And, and honestly, today when I walked into your dressing room and there were Spanx just uh, out on I your think chair, that that's... was actually for you. I did that. Did special. you do it on purpose? Yes, I did. Yes. You left. So wait, what's the what's the right answer? I know we're confused. I guess most people like but two. Actually, or three. remember, Jill Bauer likes three. Rolling them up, but then you need a basket. I agree. You? I think it's good for beach towels. Okay. Okay. All right. We started off the week hanging with some of our best fan friends, and we had that virtual block party. So now we're going to add another one to the to the group. Yes, we are about to surprise Melinda Spate from Upper Marlboro, Maryland. She turns 53. Oh, on Melinda. Well, Melinda's husband William asked for our help. He wanted to give her a good old birthday wish. So last year they planned to celebrate Melinda's birthday on the plaza. Well, that didn't happen, but we're going to try to make it up for them. So we're going to give William a call. Look at their Halloween oh, costumes. How cute so are cute. they? I heard one time William changed the channel and Melinda got really mad at him. <laughs> William? Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning to you. Okay, Wait. so William, we're ready to pull the surprise off for you. Can you see William? Yes, we're getting ready to. My son has to. Turn it? There you go. Your husband's Hi. in charge. Oh, there you there go. There you okay. are. Here you go. All right, Hi, William. Y'all know I'm backwards. Okay. backwards. That's okay. Good morning. Good, Good morning. morning. Okay, so we're ready. Can you take us to your lovely bride? Sure can. Oh, so boy. Exciting. We can't wait to so surprise her. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Meg, yeah. I need you to get this call. Hold on, Jeff. Okay. Hey! <laughs> hey, girl. Happy birthday. We wanted to wish you a happy birthday. We're sorry you couldn't come see us. Hi, how are you? I'm good. <laughs> okay, wait, I know we, we, you're on TV. Is that okay if we record you? Your husband is super cool. Uh, he, he said that you guys were trying to come here to visit us on the plaza, and we're sorry you couldn't come, so we're trying to give you our next best thing. We want to say we love you and happy early birthday. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's so cool. <laughs> okay, you're our, you're our favorite fan of the week we maybe have ever had. Do you want to play a little game of trivia with us and see if we can get you a birthday present? Okay. <laughs> okay, here we go. So all week long, Melinda, we've been debating something really yucky. Should women wear underwear underneath what item of clothing? Thanks. Yes. 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 Okay, Melinda. So not only did your hubby tell us how much you love watching our show, but he also let us know that one of your favorite hobbies is crocheting and crafting. So we are sending you an $1,000 gift card to Joanne for all of your crafting needs. <laughs> Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. Oh, and, oh my God. and just one more thing, Melinda. We know that your family's everything, so we knew that you're going to have to celebrate with them. So, Maya, Dante, your baby grandson, Ivan, come on in. They got some oh birthday God, treats yes. for you. Are they there? Let me see. There they are. Oh, you got a lot of love in your family. What a beautiful. Oh, look at that baby. Ivan. What a beautiful oh, baby. What a beautiful family, y'all. Thank you for sharing your early birthday with us. Yes, and William, don't change the channel again. We heard Melinda yeah, does no, not she, like that. Oh, my God. Yes, no, yes. I'm going to tell you something. I came in that one time and changed it to sports channel. I got to look like I thought I was going to get my behind whoop. Melinda. <laughs> Everything else in between. Yes, well, we, are, we are Team Melinda all the way. Thank you, Melinda. Happy birthday, hon. Bye, William. Bye, guys. Bye, everybody. Uh, and if you are one of our most loyal viewers, you want to nominate somebody who is, head to hodenjenna.com. <sighs> Wait, that was the best. I love Melinda we so love her. much. Today Talks continues after the break. Our Across America journey here in Louisville, Orlando, Kentucky. Kentucky. Cleveland.
reporting on an America rebuilding after the pandemic. How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. <laughs> Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it. Everybody, good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. Our Across America journey here in Louisville, Orlando, Kentucky. Cleveland. Reporting on an America rebuilding after the pandemic. How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Killer Role, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Killer Role, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. Jamie Lee Curtis is a lot of things. She's a movie star, best-selling children's book author, and one of our favorite all-time favorite people to talk to. <laughs> she sure is, and she's always juggling lots of products, projects, including a podcast Perfect for your family road trips this summer called Letters from Camp. Now it's in season two. Hey, Camp Cartwright Camp. is represented. <laughs> uh, hey, if I represent, I represent. I love you, ladies. I love this show already today. I love your birthday surprise. I'm a number two. <laughs> And, You're a number two? Um, oh, good. Thank you. I, I knew we had so I much thought, in common. I it would be Jamie. Of course she's yeah. a two. And... And mostly, Hoda, you eat potato chips before <laughs> you go to air. And I just want to let you know, I just want to let you know that I it's four in the morning for me, so I'm not having a potato chip yet. But I do love a good potato chip. Oh, my you God. love that Literally. she's carrying Wait. them around like a, ba like a purse. <laughs> Like a water bottle. I just, what I love is we all try to pull it together. Yes. And what I love is that right before you were going to air, you were eating potato <laughs> chips, and I just, it, you like have my heart forever. Oh. <gasps> okay, we love this, this, podcast, this podcast. Is, I'm going to listen to yeah. it with my daughter who's going yeah. to camp for the first time this summer. So this is this is season two of Letters from Camp. It's a coming of age story of a young girl who goes to sleepaway camp for the first time. Last season, we had my godson, Jake Gyllenhaal, be our guest star. Mm. It stars Edie Patterson and Kirby Hell Baptiste and Sonny Sandler and myself yes. as the camp director, Director Sue. But this season... We have somebody comes in and tries to say that they own the camp, and that is played by none other than Daniel Radcliffe. Wow. Oh, wow. Okay. Wow. Are you? A, were you a camper, Jamie? Did you go to camp as a kid? Hello. <laughs> I, I loved camp. I loved camp. I loved everything about it. I loved the sights, the smells, the tastes. Ugh. I loved my trunk. I loved lanyards. I loved lanyards. And songs and bug juice. I loved it all. Oh, I feel the same way. I still dream about the uh -huh. camp that I went to. But will you just tell us what one of your letters home would have said? Well, they were always complaining about getting hurt. <laughs> oh, right? You know, it's like, my mom, my dad, I sprained my toe. <laughs> Jenna wrote a couple of letters. I wrote herself. one that said, I, dear mom and dad, I have so many friends. And then the next letter said, dear mom and dad, that last letter was a lie. <laughs> I have no friends. <laughs> well, just so you know, this show started because my showrunner, writer, goddaughter, Boko Half, sent me a letter that I only received a year ago when she was 12. She's now 27. Oh, my gosh. Uh, and that started it. Her mother sent me a letter she found in a box that said my name on it, but she had never sent it. And so when we opened it a, two years ago, it stimulated this idea of doing podcast letters from that. camp. How many godchildren do you have? I know. <laughs> do you know what? I actually have quite a few. And I find it to be the most 
loving gesture, um, the most supportive gesture that a mother can bestow to me as their friend, that they would trust me to be the godmother of their children. I have to say, I love my godparents. Yeah. Oh, I, you right. just made me miss <laughs> camp and my godparents <laughs> and that beautiful water and, bottle. And, well, and by the way, the water bottle was a gift from Boko, uh, who and she, she sent it to me because I'm staff, because I'm director Sue uh, in the show. And before I lose you people, I know you guys love books. My friend Joanna Kotler made this book, uh, and I know. Jenna, you always yes. are looking for a good book yes. for children. So here it is, If I Were a Dog by Joanna Kotler. Thank I you. You know out. I want book recommendations from you. Thank and you, you know so what? much. Isn't that what Jamie does? She always gives away her time. She You're sure the coolest, does. Jamie. We love you. Uh, you can check out. I love you. We love I, you. I think you. Absolutely rock. I'm Natalie Morales and welcome to our today all day special where we are taking a look back at some of the high octane interviews I've done with the cast of the Fast and Furious. With the release of F9, the franchise's ninth installment, there is no better time to revisit my conversations with the film's stars, including Vin Diesel, Dwayne Johnson, Paul Walker, Ludacris, Jordana Brewster, Michelle Rodriguez and Tyrese Gibson. F9 is produced by Universal Pictures, which is part of our parent company, NBC Universal. I've had the pleasure of interviewing the cast at amazing locations over the years. In Rio for the release of Fast Five, in London for Furious Six, and at the Toretto House for Furious Seven, just after the death of Paul Walker, the group's co-star. And I even got to hang out with Vin Diesel in a helicopter. Over the next half hour, we're going to revisit those memorable moments as this year marks two decades worth of fast cars, thrilling heists, and most importantly, tales of family. First up, let's head to Rio, where I visited with the cast in 2011, before the release of Fast Five. Bon dia, você, as they say here. And as you know, these movies, the Fast, fast and Furious franchise, have broken box office records, and they have a cult-like following. They're back. I live my life a quarter mile at a time. For those 10 seconds or less, I'm free. The cast. I'm down. The cars. The races. Crashes. The babes. The franchise speeding across Los Angeles. Miami, Tokyo, Mexico, and now Rio. Fast Five, it's faster, even more furious, and now going to the max, IMAX. Vin Diesel, Paul Walker, and the gang reunited once more, and they've got company. The men we're after are professional runners. They like speed and guaranteed to go down the hardest possible way, so make sure you've got your thunderwear on. We find them. We take them as a team and we bring them back. And above all else, we don't ever, ever let them get in the cars. And the cast of the Fast Five is Paul Walker, Vin Diesel, Jordana Brewster, Chris Ludacris Bridges, and Dwayne Johnson. Good morning to all you guys. Great to be here with you live in Rio. Thanks, feels good to be here. Good to be here. Now, Paul, you, you've said that this movie is, is a franchise that just never seems to end. Is it gonna yeah. keep going and going? I don't know. I think the fans are dictating that right now at this point. So, uh, you know, we're excited. The reaction to this one seems really strong, seems positive, and uh, that's all we want. So we'll there, see what happens. There you go. And, and Vin, I know uh, for you, you've said that, that the fans really relate because this is a family of misfits. What do you mean? <laughs> 
Uh, just what just what that is. Uh, it's a it's a family brought together of people. It, from the first movie, the whole idea was that Dom Toretto was the father figure of a family of misfits. Mm -hmm. And in you some being Dom. ways, Dom Toretto, yeah. yeah. And in some ways, this movie, Fast and Five, uh, continues that concept. And so we have a very big family, and family is a very big theme in this movie. It is. In fact, Jordana plays your sister yes. in this movie, not to give anything away, but the family is growing That's right. a little That's bit. Right. And, and Jordana, actually, you and I have a lot in common because you're half Brazilian. Mm -hmm. Your mother's Brazilian. You actually grew up here as a kid in Brazil as well. So to be back here shooting in Rio, what was that like? It's amazing. I mean, I absolutely love Rio, and I have a lot of family here, so it was a gift to be able to come home. And, um, you know, a lot of my heart's here, so it was a gift. It's did you teach these guys anything about Brazilian culture, how to speak? I did, and you know, the food here is amazing. We've been out to um, a lot of the Chuashka ideas here, and have had caipirascas, caipirinhas, and, and, um, and uh, yeah, they've been enjoying themselves for sure. And, and Chris, of course, you're a world famous musician as well. You got a hot <laughs> song out right now, Break Your Heart with Tayo Cruz, album coming out this summer. So if you had to choose, you got acting, you got music. What do you pick? Standing here amongst all Standing these great here. actors, I would have to say uh, right now I, I would choose the acting, of course. But music is my number one love. But of course, oh, hey, being in a movie with these guys right here, I don't think anything can match that. So okay. I'm happy to be back. And I, you talked about breaking records. This one right here is going to break all the records that have been. Trust me. Fast five. Trust yeah, me on that. absolutely. And, oh, and yeah. Dwayne, uh -huh. you are the new guy to the bunch, new to the family. Were there any hazing rituals involved? <laughs> No, there wasn't any hazing. <laughs> you know, these guys will try to haze for a Tough little bit. Love. You know, then, then it's, you know. <laughs> Who wins? Let me guess. I gotta say, no, no, no. I gotta say, these guys were great. And you think about how epic the franchise has been over the course of 10 years and how difficult that is to just to sustain that type of success. These, uh, this group of actors has done an incredible job at delivering an incredible product over the past 10 years. So I was happy to come on board, help elevate this thing, create a character that's gonna be formidable. And, and chase these guys down, hunt these guys down, and bring their asses in. Sorry to cut so early Ooh, in the morning. Wow, wow. I'm not excited. Sweet, sweet. West Coast. Uh, <laughs> you're so big, buff, and strong. Should I keep going? And good looking, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And humble. And humble. <laughs> but I hear you actually had a hard time getting into those fast little cars. Is that well, true? I, I can appreciate those cars, but you know, it's a good thing, which is why I'm a, I'm a pickup man. Ford Tough, Bill Ford Tough, all the way. These guys. Uh, all of them, by the way, have the luxury of driving those super, uh, super cool, super, super cool, cool cars. Yeah. Jordana, you didn't even know how to drive when you started in the film. Yeah, I didn't. How'd you get? To, you're like Miss Speed Racer. I'm a New Yorker, so I did. I didn't have my license yet, so I had to get it. And by now, I'm I'm a little better. And, and yeah. then you've you've produced. This is your second time producing uh, this film now. So. What's it, a little added pressure, producer, plus the actor in the film? Um, for me, it's an opportunity to really celebrate the entire process. Not a bad gig, right? Well, coming up, we're continuing our journey into our Fast and Furious vault by traveling to London for Furious 6. Stay with us. This is about 50 votes. If you can't get bipartisanship here, where are you going to get it? If China decided to cover this up, can we ever actually get a definitive answer? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. begins here in Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky. In Cleveland. Our Across America journey reporting on an America rebuilding and reimagining a future after the pandemic. Breaking news tonight, the ceasefire in the Middle East after 11 days of deadly violence. Richard Engel is on the ground. Do you think there's a connection between policing and racism? How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. 
Tonight, the CDC's new outdoor mask guidelines. What changed that allowed this new recommendation to be made? If we do nothing, what happens to a city like Houston? You're going to repeat this movie over and over again. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Welcome back and thanks for joining us as we look back on the Fast and Furious movies. Now, London was the perfect backdrop for my interview with this Furious 6 cast in 2013. Take a look. Oh. The Fast and the Furious. More than a decade of high energy action. Cars, cash, racing, rivalries. It don't matter if you win by an inch or a mile. Winning's winning. Lighting up the big screen, smashing box office records. The first five films, raking in $1.5 billion worldwide. Hot rides, hot girls, hot locales. Now revving up for a sixth time. The Fast and the Furious fan favorites are all back. This time, this is London, baby for their most high stakes adventure yet. And among the cast of Fast and Furious 6, we have with us, of course, returning Vin Diesel. We have Michelle Rodriguez also returning this time around. We have Tyrese Gibson, Paul Walker, Jordana Brewster, and Chris Ludacris Bridges. Great to have you all back. Thank you for having Welcome us. to London, which you guys know and love well, I hear, right? Yeah, absolutely. All the action took place here. We even brought your cars <laughs> to be here with you yes. today to make you feel right at home. Thank you. Vin, just when I think that you can't possibly top the success of what happened with five, here we go with number six. I've seen it, and the action is even better. So what are the expectations? I mean, how far can, the, can you go with this? I think we can go as far as the fans uh, demand us to keep making movies. Uh, we've been lucky that we've had such a strong fan base. They love the action, but they love our cast. Um, the action wouldn't be anything without yeah. the cast, wouldn't be anything without the performances and the dedication that the cast puts into making these action sequences seem real and feel real and add stakes to each of the action sequences. But ultimately, we keep doing it because because we, of the fans, the because people. of them, them, because of right. all of them. Yes, and they come every wherever you are, they show up. Exactly. Now I understand from the last one we saw you all take off, go your separate ways after a successful heist in Rio. Yeah. So now you start off in all the different parts of the world, That's but right. you come back together. And Tyrese, what brings you all back together? You know what? Um, you know, I think the family and the bond on and off camera, um, you know, and it's, to be honest, when you're working on a movie of this magnitude, domestically and internationally, it's nothing like feeling like you're working on something that people are really anticipating. Mm -hmm. It makes you really think about the characters, it really thinks about the story and the next level. It's like, right. imagine Fast Five being the most successful one and then following it with six. I mean, we can't go backwards, we gotta go up. Right. It's a lot of pressure, but we deliver. You Speaking know of I mean? family, the family's expanded a bit. You know, we see uh, Paul and Jordana, your characters, Brian and Mia, have a little baby That's this right. time around. Mm -hmm. So parenting like kind of changes things yeah. a little bit, right? Yeah. Yeah. How does it change, Paul? Um, for me, I feel like we've earned it. We've been doing this together for a long time. And, uh, you know, I, I think that what we've all learned, earned together, I mean, it's, it's not something that can be forced. You know, mm -hmm. I think that if you were to take each one of us individually and we were supposed to, and we just had this a basic encounter on the street, I don't think this would happen. Yeah. But we've been forced together more or less now for a long time. And as a result, cool things have happened. And I feel That's like uh, this was just the next evolution of it. It was baby time. That was just, that was it. And, and Michelle, we see, I mean, it, I don't think it's a surprise to any fans that your character comes back because we <laughs> saw a glimpse of you in five. That's right. Your character actually is still alive. Yes. I'm not going to give away any more, you know, <laughs> surprises here. But um, were, did you know when, when the plot lines were, were being written way back when that your character was going to come back? That's a funny thing, you know, because, you know, me and Vin have such a long-standing 13-year friendship uh, since you know on and off screen 
And, you know, I found out about it by buying a ticket to go see it in Paris. Uh-huh. And then when I call really? him up, when I call up then, and I'm like, dude, what's up? Why Can is there a picture of me? <laughs> and when were you planning on telling me about this? He, you know, went on to tell me, well, well, I told you in four, two years ago, <laughs> that this was going to happen. So here we are. Excellent. I know the fans are excited about <laughs> that. And, and Chris, I mean, to be a part of this cast, amazing. But also to shoot in London during the Olympics. I mean, did you guys get to take in and, and have some fun at the same time, Absolutely. go to some of the games? Yeah, I definitely attended some of the games. And like you said, you know, to be here with such a great cast, a great family, uh, just evolving and progressing every single film. And I'm just, I'm just happy to learn, you know what I mean? But being here in London was great for me. I have a whole new appreciation for Europe. Mm -hmm. Such great memories from that interview. Now, still to come, a touching conversation with the Furious 7 cast after the death of their beloved co-star, Paul Walker. We'll be right back. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, boom. That's just shop today with Joe Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day Kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now, it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. We're back with a look back at the Fast and Furious movies. In November of 2013, Paul Walker, who played Brian O'Connor in the films, died tragically in a car accident. The cast members, who consider themselves a family, sat down with me after his death at the Toretto House, which is a significant location in the film's storyline. As they processed their grief, they reflected on how they wanted to honor Walker through the release of Furious 7. I had to gather the family around the table because it just seems appropriate to be here at the Toretto House yes. and in the backyard and this barbecue like you guys do in the film. And I can't believe how much you've already eaten. It's unbelievable I know. how much she eats. I have to apologize. Yeah. I, I ate a lot of the beans. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're prepped. We're ready. I'll move away from her. We're outdoors. <laughs> Obviously, it's got to be a really difficult time to be doing the press tour and promoting a film at the same time. You're also dealing and talking about the loss of your friend. Paul yeah. Walker. Yeah. Yeah. How much does that weigh on you all? As much as we could find ourselves feeling like, man, well, isn't yeah. it selfish to be out promoting and trying to sell all of this energy about the movie when, when the obvious happened? But it's it's that that is the reason to do it because um, acting is art, and Paul is a part of this culture and our world and what we've all did together for all of these years. And we want the world to know that this is some beautiful art that he left us with. When I finally saw the movie, I, I breathed a huge sigh of relief because it is beautiful and he's so good in it. And yeah. the tribute to it is so fitting and beautiful. And I'm, I am really happy that the fans get to see that. 
no matter what conversations we had with him, it would always circle back around to how much he liked to give. And it's his, you know, his humanitarian efforts and his philanthropic efforts and, you know, his reach out worldwide organization, no matter what, it would always come back to how he wanted to change the world. And he's still doing that. His brothers were so key in helping you to complete the film, James. Mm -hmm. Are they now part of this big family as well? You know, directing his brothers and, and, and directing um, them um, to, 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 to work with, you know, with everyone else here, mm -hmm. I think gave everyone here closure as well. And yeah. I think, you know, that, I think that was something that was very important for us. When we all clearly could see that Paul's brothers look exactly like him, and we got into how to move forward, and they were physically on the set with us every day, we actually felt like our brother was still with us. Dwayne, you came into the family a little bit later in Fast Five, and mm -hmm. was it apparent to you right away that this was a bond that was gonna be forever? I had the privilege of coming into something that was already established and incredibly successful before I got there. Because we were all friends outside of the movie. Right, We'd right, see each other right. around, support each other's movies. And we had the like same that. tattoo artist. We had the same yeah, tattoo artist, right? yes. <laughs> he has a picture of me on his lower back. Is that <laughs> true? <laughs> I gotta see it, yeah, come on! Show us. <laughs> <laughs> we have such a great team. It's mm -hmm. not like other movies. When we come to work, we all want the movie to be mm -hmm. as special as possible. We all knew that it was our job to leave a legacy for someone we love and someone the world loved. And that's why the ending is as precious as it is. Hats off to you, James. Yeah. 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 Everyone, everyone, everyone. So much love there for their co-star, Paul Walker, and what a conversation we had, so emotional. Now that same year, I jumped into helicopter with Vin Diesel where he revealed to me the special inspiration behind his baby daughter's name. Justin, you didn't think you could get any better, huh? Here we go. With the latest film in the Furious franchise set for release next week, what better way to spend some time with Vin Diesel than up in the air, overlooking where it all started? See the Hollywood sign there, of course. <laughs> do you remember the first time you saw that sign when yes, you first I moved do. here? Yes, I do. What was uh, that like? It was 1990. Yeah. Um, I was looking at that Hollywood sign and so confident that I was going to be a big star. Yeah. And I felt like, you know, this industry and this town hasn't seen anything like me since Clark Gable. And a year and a half later, I still didn't even have an agent. I had to go back to New York with my tail between my legs and go back to Mount yeah. Sing and ask friends to let me sleep on their couch. When did you find in yourself that you wanted to become an actor? At what point was that? I grew up in an artist's housing yeah. in, in Manhattan. So I was exposed to actors and jazz musicians and painters and sculptors at a very early age. Miles Davis was recording in my basement. Wow, really? Yeah, it was a That's real- That's amazing. So I always wanted to be a performer. Now, 14 years into the Fast and Furious saga, he's a superstar. But with the death of his close friend and co-star Paul Walker, the making of Furious 7 was a struggle. How has Paul influenced your life? Not just, I mean, you talked about how much he is a brother to you. He taught you about fatherhood. He went into fatherhood a lot earlier than I did. That he took on that role of kind of being the guide into fatherhood for me. Um, it's kind of beautiful. The one thing Paul always wanted me to do yeah. was be present at, at um, you know, at my child's birth. I mean, he was so adamant about it. When I did Fast and Furious 5 and we were on the, the bridge in Puerto Rico and we're doing the end scene and Paul Walker and I come out of that car, her water broke in New York and my son was being born. He was like, we can film later. No, this is not a deal. You have to go now. And, he was right, and I did. How has fatherhood changed you? I don't know if it's because I have kids. I don't want to be a killer. Yeah. I, I don't enjoy killer mode as much as I used to. And if I, I can't do it as often. 
It may be even less now. Earlier this week, Vin shared exclusively with us the name of his new baby girl. While I was in the delivery room, mm -hmm. I said that I felt like Paul was there. I named her Pauline. Pauline, that's awesome. Wow, it is so moving to see these interviews again. Now, fatherhood is such an important theme throughout the franchise, and I always enjoy sitting down with Vin. And recently, we spoke about F9, the latest installment to the franchise. So stay tuned right after the break. Right now on NBC News Now. Here in Chicago, about 20,000 middle schoolers returning to school today. They also took advantage of existing vaccine distribution networks throughout Alaska. It does seem as if this White House doesn't want to bring a lot of high-profile attention to the issue. What efforts might depoliticize vaccine hesitancy? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. It does seem as if this White House doesn't want to bring a lot of high-profile attention to the issue. What efforts might depoliticize vaccine hesitancy? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Two decades, nine films, and six billion dollars later, the Fast and Furious crew is back, and they haven't lost a step. Well, that was new. You were just, can I say, a baby back when this franchise started? We're talking like 20 years ago. The 20 year anniversary is when this film is being released. The Fast franchise has always entertained, but at its core, it's always been about family. I think of the legacy of this franchise as well. I mean, besides the fast cars, the unstoppable action, what else is it about this franchise that has such an enduring legacy? The question that I ask myself as I embark on the finale, Fast 10, and... and it is the last, the 10th? Wow. But I believe at the end of the day, people come to Fast because the characters we want to know what happens next. We want to know how they evolve. But going back to that legacy, going back to that the legacy, family that you built, the family that we've built, is it's you, not just on-screen family. It's not just this, on -screen. These people have been in your life throughout. I mean, that's ultimately what the true blessing is. Work with people that you love. And of course, this film, you clearly bring up Paul and his legacy throughout the film as well. He's never gone. Ever, He's never forgotten in this franchise. Ever, ever, ever. I never think I'm, I'm continuing the franchise in his absence. I always feel like I'm continuing the franchise in his honor. And as each installment one-ups itself with action and star power, John Cena plays Toretto's estranged brother in Fast 9, the universal appeal of Fast only grows. Will you be my ride or die? Because we've got our own little VIP tram to go see you on your ride. Okay, yes. I mean, <laughs> guys, you want to do that? Ride or die! This one takes you to the jungles, it takes you to Tokyo, London, and outer space. All right, it's crazy. Where else? I mean, where, where else, else could you, you go? go? <laughs> yeah. Back in time. Oh, there or the you future. go. Back to the future. For Fast 9, after a year's delay, the future is now. Already grossing nearly $300 million overseas ahead of its U.S. release. It's so surreal to come full circle and to see something completed like that. I don't often reflect back enough on, on yeah. stuff that I've done. I always feel like um, 
I'm a minute away from having to produce the next film. And for Vin, who is already six months into pre-production on Fast 10, the hope is this movie brings audiences back to the theater. Is there pressure, though, thinking that this is the movie that is hopefully going to pack audiences and pack theaters once again? Last year, I might have been um, frustrated. Now I feel like we're here just in time to salvage that theatrical experience. Good it, luck and it, great success. Godspeed as always. Mi padrino. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. It's hard to believe these movies are still going strong after two decades. It has been a delight to sit down with Vin Diesel and the cast over all these years. And thank you for watching with us here on Today All Day. And I hope you enjoyed your fast and furious walk down memory lane. F9 is produced by Universal Pictures, which is part of our parent company, NBC Universal. Welcome to Today All Day. All day? Today All Day. All day. This is a long oh, way of asking, yeah, who's your okay. favorite character you've ever all played? Right. A unicorn. The unicorn. You gotta have the unicorn. <laughs> what is she right there? That's why you're saying all these nice things? Yeah, she gave me the, the look. Sorry to disturb your day. Everyone's mad at you, Willie. Better make this fast. Yeah. I don't want the wrath of Luna. <laughs> when I see you, I always think, I wonder what his quote would be. Give us six minutes and we'll ask as many questions as we can. Welcome to Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Cold cut. My buddy Cal cooking with me. That's no babysit. It's called parenting. What was the first book you remember loving? Heart Smart Today. With simple exercises to strengthen your heart. Make the most of your beach days. It's all about the tracksuit now. How wow. good do they look? I now pronounce you husband and wife. Kiss the bride. This morning, a story of people helping people. You've received tons of letters from people who have been inspired. Let's do the weather out. <laughs> okay. All you gotta do is say, it's cold, it's warm, it's raining, it's snowing. That's it. One of our most favorite yes. franchises ever, wow. Ambush Makeovers. Wow. Okay. Look at it. It doesn't, it doesn't look, look so good. No, it doesn't look good. Will you okay. judge us in a cook-off? I yes. will, and okay. you guys will definitely win something. Today, all day. All day? All day. And welcome back. We're back with Today Food. This morning's guest, you know her, you love her, Ree Drummond. She is known as the pioneer woman, and today she's showing us two easy recipes for a family feast. But first, what life has like been with for her on the ranch for Ree and her family since the quarantine started? The energy is rolling. I can feel it. Reed Drummond is no stranger to working from home. In fact, home has always been where the Drummond family life flourishes. This picturesque Oklahoma ranch has been the backdrop for Reed's hit television show, The Pioneer Woman, for nearly a decade. You guys ready for this? And when quarantine became a reality, Reed looked no further than her very own family to take on the role of backup crew. Reed's four kids stepped in behind the camera to assist their pioneer mom. Oh my gosh, it's... Lad Drummond. When not cooking for this brood, including hungry hubby Lad, refocuses on easy recipes from her website that just relaunched, which gets more than 20 million views a month. And live from her ranch, there she is, the pioneer woman herself, Ree Drummond. Hey, Ree, how are you? Hey, Hoda, I am great. How are you? Girl, it is so good to see you. Whenever you're on the show, everyone goes, oh my God, Ree's on. Savannah was like, who has Ree? Oh, I love Ree. I know, everybody does. So Hi, Savannah. We're, I wish we're I could be there with you. Oh, of we course. Too. I miss we, you guys. Well, we are team Ree all the way, but you got to walk us through what happens. So you're, you're doing your show in your house like you always do, and all of a sudden the pandemic hits. Your crew has to exit stage left, and you got your kids. You have four children, <laughs> and they become your crew. Is that how it went down? Well, my kids have always come in handy on the ranch. My husband loves having all these extra ranch hands, but this is the first time that I've sort of gotten to use them as my own special kind of ranch hand. So, yes, my TV crew is actually in the UK, and so we knew it would be a while before they were able to come back. So we just jumped in, used our cell phones, and started filming our shows, and We've done probably 25 episodes, and we're getting ready to film one later today with my older daughter, Alex. And so, you know, just like everybody else, we're taking the most mm -hmm. from this situation and, and doing what we can. Well, we're going to get to your recipes in a minute, but, Ree, I heard that 
like us, you have pandemic pants. <laughs> We're into those. Yeah, we are for it. We are here for yeah. it. Can you tell us about yours? <laughs> my pandemic pants are so friendly. They're my best friend. They, they don't judge me. Um, they, they try their best to make me look good. It doesn't really matter what I look like because it's all below the counter anyway. Yes. But um, I, I saw weeks ago on Twitter, somebody called jeans hard pants. <laughs> and I've, I've been avoiding my hard pants ever since. Yeah. Like, look, we hate we hard hate, pass yeah. on the hard pants. Absolutely. All right. But and we, I, I need the home edit girls to come live with me too. By the way. <laughs> I, oh, yeah. All right, Risa, we want to get to the recipe because you got a couple of great ones. People are wondering what to make for dinner. You've got a, a simple, easy pasta recipe. What are we cooking? Yes. Yeah, so I am so into shortcut homemade ravioli. And what makes it shortcut is that I use wonton wrappers. So these are just in the store. And I made a little mixture of ricotta, parmesan, salt, pepper, lemon zest. Wow. And I just put a little, I mm. can't get too close to you guys, but put a little dollop in the middle of the wonton wrapper. And then I just take my clean finger mm -hmm. <laughs> and rub a little egg wash around the edge mm. and then take a second wonton wrapper and put it on top, line up the edges, and then you just want to press it together. Oops, I grabbed three. That's okay. <laughs> it's, I'm doing this on the fly. And then just force all the air out. And honestly, if you can't make, make homemade pasta dough or you don't have time, this is such a great shortcut. I like that. And then you just can get an assembly line with your kids, make as many of these as you want, and then just drop them into salted water one by one. And look. All right, I love those. Little... Pieces of ravioli, just delicious, fresh hey, and ready to go. Hey, Ree, can we? We only have a minute, but we want to get to that dessert. That what is it? Ice it's box, ice box yeah. cake. Oh yeah, blackberry ice box cake. So the frozen pound cakes that we all know and love. I shave the top off, crumble it into crumbs, pour in butter. Very easy, and then just put this on the stove top, toast the crumbs, mm. and then the cake that's left. You slice the cake into three slices lengthwise. I already started a layer, and it's cake, a mixture of jam, blackberries, and lemon juice, Yum. and lemon zest. Yum. Huh. It's so fun to use a frozen pound cake because then you cut that whole well, step. Oh, my gosh. Uh, you it know, doesn't even look hard to make. Ree, like Ree, it looks delicious. Something Savannah so, and I could make. We're happy. Yeah. All right. We you just layer it kind of like lasagna. All right. Cake, jam, cream. Ree, and then you wind we up. love you. We love you. We can't wait for your book to come out. Thank you for cooking for us. Uh, you can check out Thank her you, recipes girl. at today.com slash food. Time to take you into the kitchen for a one and done meal because nobody wants to clean a bunch of messy bowls or pans. No, we sure don't. And if you believe you are what you eat, you might want to start your day with a cool and colorful smoothie bowl. So we called on Catherine McCord, one of our pals, whose We Alicious Instagram is filled with healthy and easy recipes. Yeah. Hey, Catherine, how are you? How are you? We like we licious. Okay, so there's a smoothie bowl uh, that you love. So tell, just tell us what you love about the concept of this. Well, I love smoothie bowls because, well, you guys know that I love a smoothie. Yes. Um, and smoothie bowls are just fun. They're perfect for breakfast, lunch, snack. And honestly, I love ice cream, so it's a great dessert replacement, too. I would say that we make smoothie bowls six out of seven nights a week in our house. And you've got three kids. Do yeah. you find like this is a good way to sneak in the vegetables and obviously the fruit? Totally. So smoothie bowls, like you use a base of bananas, but you can get in frozen cauliflower, you can get in greens, oh, and all yeah. you're going to see are these like gorgeous bright flavors. We've got like a double chocolate one today. Mm -hmm. So it's all about just getting in as much nutrition as possible in a fun, gorgeous, and delicious way. All right, let's get our ingredients. What do we need? All right, so we're going to start with dragon fruit. So this is actually what a real dragon fruit, like a fresh dragon yeah. fruit looks like, but this is frozen dragon fruit and they come in little packets like this, the same as acai. And it looks like this. So we're just going to dump in frozen bananas, raspberries that are frozen and that dragon fruit and just put it all right into your blender. And then I like to add a little protein powder. So mm -hmm. you can go vanilla protein powder, chocolate, whatever you like. Um, you could also do collagen peptides, anything to just get in a little bit more protein. So just put that in and you can see like 
super simple ingredients. And to Jenna's point, yeah. this is a great opportunity to toss in a little bit of frozen cauliflower. Um, believe it or not, there's a little protein in cauliflower. You're never going to see it or taste it, but it's just can a we, great way to get it. Can we pause you for one second? Vegetable. Can we pause you on one second? Because we're we're unclear on the dragon fruit. This, what is, dra <laughs> is dragon fruit like a cousin of the kiwi? What does it taste like? Yeah, I mean, look, it actually, my kids love it. Um, so if you cut it into cubes, it actually looks like dice, yeah. <laughs> but it has a very mild flavor, easy to peel, cube, and isn't it cool? Yeah, and it's it comes cool. in pink, red, and white. Okay. And also protein powder safe and good for kids. Yep, as long as just like get a very clean protein powder. I always say like try a few different ones to see what you like, but absolutely kids can have protein okay. powder. It's a great question. Okay. And then all we're gonna do is top it with just a little liquid. So like in a smoothie, you know, you use a bunch of liquid. In a smoothie oh, bowl, yeah. less liquid because we want it to be thick and creamy. And then all we do is turn on the blender and <laughs> pretend that that yeah, just yeah. totally went its way but this is the trick you want to use your tamper that's the way you just like tamper. really get everything down and when it's finished you're just going to swirl it up beautiful put it into a bowl. look at that color isn't it crazy gorgeous that's beautiful and that's it it's ready well now now the real fun gets oh. in you guys have kids like and by the way, very adult friendly too, you know, all the acai bowl stores yeah, mm -hmm. like out there, but we're doing dragon fruit today. This is when it gets really engaging. DIY, granola, chocolate chips, yeah, raspberries, chocolate blueberries, chips. even bee pollen, like anything that you love, even cereal, like get creative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's so you so put it fun. on top or you mix the whole thing in there? You can do it any which way you like. I mean, I sort of love like the presentation. So you can see like, I'm just putting like any and everything that I like. You know, you have like, you think of like a yogurt bar, you know, you set up the yogurt and then like all the different toppings. Well, when you have the smoothie bowls, like you can get like all kinds of colors in there, yeah, mm -hmm. textures, um, just, just a great yes. way to get even more nutrition. Will you just show us you your, yeah, is final. that your acai? Well, this That's one is actually my double chocolate mm, because, yes. I mean, doesn't everyone love chocolate yes, for breakfast? Yes, we do. Everybody <laughs> does. That looks delicious. And the other ones are outside people. I know. Do you? So yeah. What would you would you say this is breakfast, lunch, dinner, a snack, or dessert for you guys? I would say dessert. Breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, and that's uh, the point. You can eat it whenever, Catherine. It's so good. Thank to see you, you so much. That looks yummy. That's looks a good awesome. idea. Miss you guys. You miss you too. Okay. You so too. to check out this website and all of the recipes, head to today.com/food. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring is from, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. <laughs> Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it. Everybody, good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. All right, nothing, nothing like ice cream in the summertime. Oh, that's so true. And chef and food personality Artie Sakara has an easy recipe with an added ingredient. Artie! Artie, how are you? Oh, how are you? Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to be here. Oh Jenna, you said my name correctly. I, I said you're up By the way, I did. RT, we were practicing. Yes, and so, this new kitchen behind you looks gorgeous. Killer. Awesome. 
It's a beauty. Are you so happy to have moved? Thank you. I know. This is so... Yes, yeah, so happy. I mean, we moved from L.A. to Raleigh in February. Um, and one of the reasons we moved is because, look, this is my kitchen. This is my kitchen. <laughs> this is still my kitchen. Oh, my God. I just have so much room that we never had in L.A. And we have family here. And so my kids are growing up with their cousins. Um, oh. And so we designed this kitchen, especially to do things like this, so that I could bring you into my home, even though I'm so far away from you. Oh, we're so well, we're happy. happy to see you. So you grew up in Dubai, and your ice cream sandwiches have a special ingredient. What is that? Yes. So there's a couple of special ingredients. In Dubai, um, the people there were nomads. They were Bedouins. And so when they welcomed you into their big black tents, they would give you a strong cup of coffee, really thick, that had been brewed with cardamom. So that's actually going into my dry ingredients for my cookies. Mm. Um, and they would also give you a date, these gorgeous dates. And so dates. these are actually California dates. So it's sort of a two in one for me. This is Dubai and California all wrapped up. Mm. And the whole thing that I'm trying to do is take unfamiliar flavors and foods and put them into familiar so we all sort of feel connected um, and so i took the most american thing i could think of the thing that when you smell you're like i'm home which is a chocolate chip cookie <laughs> and i'm putting that sort of arab hospitality element into it so yeah. i'm gonna get going if that's okay, okay yes, get please. going please Artie. this looks delicious <laughs> okay, so I've got butter and two kinds of sugar in my stand mixer here. I've got white sugar, and I'm using dark brown sugar because that's going to give it that good flavor and also make it chewy, right? So I cream that together. I'm going to add two eggs and vanilla. Okay. Mm -hmm. You just want to get that nice and mixed together. Then for the dry ingredients, I've got flour baking soda and salt, and then of course that gorgeous cardamom. And the cardamom, if you don't have it, you can use cinnamon, it's not a big deal. But cardamom gives it this sort of piney, flowery sort of flavor that really brings out, I think, like the deepness and the darkness of the chocolate. And it definitely kind of makes you feel like, okay, we're not here anymore, we're somewhere mm -hmm. else, right? It's one of those power spices. And I think it's even called the queen of spices. So <laughs> in it goes. And I add the flour in two batches, so you, basically so you don't have a mess all over the floor, which I forgot to do yesterday, so I made a big mess, <laughs> the first big mess in my new kitchen. So you're gonna stir that together until it comes together, and then you're gonna have cookie dough, Yum. right? After that, I've got a cup of chocolate chips, and I've got half a cup of those chopped California dates that mm. I love so much. So those go in nice and sticky and what happens is the dates kind of melt into the cookies and so you get these little pools oh, of good. molasses almost in the middle of each cookie which is oh, so good and then you're going to stir this together you're going to need some elbow grease because you want to make sure that the chocolate chips and the dates are evenly distributed I and mean, you don't want anyone getting that one cookie that doesn't have anything in it that exactly it's always so sad <laughs> when that happens <laughs> So once that's done, yeah, you bake them up. Um, you're going to use an ice cream scoop. All right. Um, any so, any real lover of ice cream has to have one of these around, so, right? So, Artie, so after I'm gonna you use that, and then Artie, I'm gonna after you bake the cookies, I don't we, we don't yeah. we don't want to rush you, but um, we're, for some reason we're we only have like 30 seconds. So after you bake them, do you just scoop some ice cream in between? Yeah, show oh, us okay. how you Let assemble. Let me show you what happens at the end. Yeah. You bake them. <laughs> Yummy. Okay. Yeah. Magic. And then all you do is you take your cookie. Oh, yeah. You put your ice cream on it. Okay, oh, that part oh, is easy. Yum. But the real magic is that then you sprinkle pistachio around oh, the Artie. edge. And that is how you Artie, finish Artie, we that. love you. Artie. Thank you so much for that recipe. Please go to today.com. <laughs> Thank you, Artie. Food. Thank you, Artie. We'll be right back. Mm, that looks delicious. Oh, yum. Tonight, the CDC's new outdoor mask guidelines. What change that allowed this new recommendation to be made? If we do nothing, what happens to a city like Houston? You're going to repeat this movie over and over again. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. 
Congratulations to Lester Holt, the most trusted TV news anchor in America, on receiving the prestigious Edward R. Murrow Lifetime Achievement Award for a career dedicated to excellence in journalism. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Everybody, good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. right. Are you ready? Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. A huge lift is underway for one of the most celebrated cities in this country, Cleveland, Ohio. Yep. This is the greatest location in the nation. <laughs> We're having a baby. Wow. The big reveal is under the lid. <laughs> Hey now. Things are looking brighter, so we want to help you find the fun in 21. <laughs> Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. Right now on NBC News Now. They've done things like installing cameras to help alert Border Patrol to people crossing. They are escaping a number of conditions there, uh, violence and persecution in their home countries. We are back with another edition of Dining with Cal, and this time we are baking up a yummy dessert that will pair perfectly with your 4th of July barbecue this weekend. We are going to make my blueberry buckle. If you've never heard of it before, it's really just kind of a fancy name for a blueberry coffee cake. Are you ready to help? <laughs> I normally make this recipe with cake flour. It's a little bit lighter and it makes it a little more fluffier. You can't always find cake flour or sometimes you just don't have it. So I'm going to show you a trick using all-purpose flour and cornstarch. The trick is to make cake flour out of all-purpose flour. You take a cup of flour, remove two tablespoons of that flour, and then add in two tablespoons of cornstarch. So we just made cake flour. Cool, huh? We need one teaspoon of baking powder. Half a teaspoon of salt. Okay, and we need a half a teaspoon of ginger. Okay, while you do that, I'm going to put the butter in here. I'm ready. Okay, ready? Count with me. We need three of these. Yeah. 
<laughs> For these recipes and more, log on to today.com slash food. Congratulations to Lester Holt, the most trusted TV news anchor in America, on receiving the prestigious Edward R. Murrow Lifetime Achievement Award for a career dedicated to excellence in journalism. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. Congratulations to Lester Holt, the most trusted TV news anchor in America, on receiving the prestigious Edward R. Murrow Lifetime Achievement Award for a career dedicated to excellence in journalism. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. This is about 50 votes. If you can't get bipartisanship here, where are you going to get it? If China decided to cover this up, can we ever actually get a definitive answer? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. It does seem as if this White House doesn't want to bring a lot of high-profile attention to the issue. What efforts might depoliticize vaccine hesitancy? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. It's summer, so chances are there's fruit on your counter that's just waiting to be enjoyed. Well, how about this? Fire up the grill. Today contributor, our good pal Elizabeth High School <laughs> is home with a lesson to show us on how to put all that fruit to good use. Are you in Mississippi? Honey, we are in Mississippi. Oh, yes. How are We're we good. Miss we miss you. Your bangs look so good. Are they new? Okay, do you really like them? Because I'm struggling. I'm struggling no, really bad. No, you look we so love chic. The bangs. Okay. Well, you know, I've got to tell y'all, I'm so impressed with y'all's hair skills during this whole corona. <laughs> I've never in my life, like, I think y'all need, y'all have a, like a second job of oh, doing no. hair and makeup. I'm super impressed. Oh, well, thank, thank you, Elizabeth. You, girl. So wait, what are you cooking? Fruit? So, okay, <laughs> normally when we think grill, we're thinking hamburgers, hot dogs, maybe even a steak. Not today, honey. We are grilling up fruit. We've got pineapple, watermelon, and peaches. And Jenna, I've got a special treat just for you. This is going to change your summer. It's a grilled pineapple margarita, and I'm telling oh. you, it's divine. Yeah, seriously. We can't wait. Okay. Roll. The one thing that you're going to want to do is to make sure that you at least get a little bit of oil on it. You don't want it to stick to your grill. And I know you're probably thinking, you know, how is this all going to work out? Um, but honestly, as long as your fruit is rather firm, you really don't have to worry about it. It's going to grill up just as easy as a hot dog. So here we are in our pineapple. We're going to add this to our zip top bag. I already have a fourth a teaspoon of honey. And then I'm going to add just a little bit of cayenne to give it just a little bit of a kick. We have some melted butter. We're going to mix this up. And while that's sitting for a second, I'm going to go ahead and start with my peaches. So all we want to do is just lightly brush the peaches on the cut side. We're only going to grill one side um, of these peaches. So we'll just grill, we'll just um, put a little oil on that. And now we're going straight onto our grill. And you know, the thing is, when I first started thinking about grilling fruit, um, I was pretty complex at how this was going to happen. And then I started remembering back to kebabs. You know, and the pineapple was always my favorite part of the kebab, and it did beautifully. There was no problem with it grilling, so that's why I got a little adventuresome and started working on these recipes as well. So we're going to get our pineapple on. Now we're going to um, put a little bit of oil on our watermelon. We'll get that on. Now, once they start, what we're really trying to do is just get some pretty grill marks, and we want those sugars to start getting caramelized. Um, so you can see here, we've already grilled some, and, um, and we've got those here, and we're going to top our pound cake. Look at that. Our, it's absolutely beautiful. You cannot even imagine how it intensifies the flavor. And now we have a little bit of caramel sauce. 
drizzle this on. This is a five minute caramel sauce. Make sure you go to thedayshow.com for this recipe. I'm telling you, it is life changing. Super simple on that. Now I'm gonna go ahead, now this is sort of, you know, sat for a few minutes. You wanna make sure that you kind of shake it off. We don't want a ton of, um, a ton of that juice on here because it will flare up just a bit. Okay, and now we have our pineapples in. Very nice. We're gonna let that cook for just a minute and while that's going, I'm gonna show you what we did with these peaches. So you take your peach and then just a little bit of goat cheese in the center, a little bit of prosciutto on top. Now, you can add this to a beautiful salad, but I'm telling you what's my favorite. If you take this and spread it on top of a piece of crostini, it is the best ordinary that you've ever had. And then I was telling you about our smoked watermelon gazpacho. This is summertime in a glass. Do not even think about making this recipe in the winter. I don't want to hear about it. It is not going to happen. It has to be summer when the watermelons are ripe and the tomatoes are fantastic. Now, this is for you, Jenna. I know you love your margarita almost as much as I do. And one of the things that makes it key is making sure that your lime has tons of juice in it. So what you want to do is this lime. Oh, look at me, my finger. This lime needs to be as smooth as a baby's butt. You don't want any big pores. That way you're gonna know that this lime is filled with juice, which made these smoked, grilled pineapple margaritas so fantastic. This is just a regular pineapple, I mean a regular margarita mix. We put it into a blender, added our grilled pineapple, and blended it up, and Lord, honey, it is fantastic. Mm. Cheers, y'all. Cheers. Oh my God, Elizabeth. We're like, we want every single thing you've done. I am grilling fruit tonight. <laughs> no, we're like desperate. No, I'm serious. Well, if y'all would just come to Mississippi, we could get that done right now. Well, come we, on. Well, well, when the pandemic is over. Yes. And I will. <laughs> I want that caramel sauce that you were drizzling on yes, everything. Yes, and that cake. Okay, and oh, it's the cake. Literally, it's, not, it's three ingredients. It's okay. butter, it's brown sugar, and milk. Five minutes, you've got caramel sauce. Okay, we're going to make it tonight. Thank you. Thank Bye you, to you and your bang. It's the cell phone line. Uh, I get that a lot. What? Outside. Are you kidding? It's like the North Pole out Hey, there. this sign isn't just a decoration. Honey, nothing in here is a decoration. It disturbs the other customer. And, I, and if I'm on, on my cell phone, I get it a lot. And people will point at me and go, you, 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 I'll kick you out of here. You go, ha, 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 you go off your cell phone. I'm like, yeah, OK, fine. <laughs> hey, everybody, it's Scott Patterson. I played Luke Danes on Gilmore Girls, and my podcast is called I Am All In. Suki. Hey, I was looking for your paprika stretch. Hey, what have I said about the counter? I know. Uh, the I... counter is a sacred space, my sacred space. You don't do yoga on the Dalai Lama's mat, and you don't come behind my counter, period. Well, my favorite part about playing Luke, you know, having a regular job. It, it's hard to have a regular job in Hollywood. It's very competitive. There aren't a lot of jobs. And it was just knowing that, uh, you know, you were going to go to work and be challenged. But uh, it, just the experience of playing such an iconic character and, and you know, the, the feedback that I get on a daily basis from it, it's, it's quite shocking. Uh, and it still surprises me. So, and it seems to be oddly, you know, growing in prominence. I mean, the, the, the role, the show, uh, the, you know, the fan base keeps growing globally. I mean, it's just, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So it's, it's, it's a wonderful experience. Uh, favorite scenes, you know, I, I really think it was that initial uh, scene in the pilot where we see him and we see Lorelai for the first time. Please, Luke. Please, please, please. How many cups have you had this morning? None. Plus? Five, but yours is better. You have a problem. Yes, I do. Junk. I tell her she has a problem. How many cups have you had? I mean, I think that, because that really sets us on the path. I mean, and it was a very difficult scene to play because it had to say so much, but you couldn't. We couldn't really tip our mitts about the potential of the relationship. We just, you know, it was a real balancing act with that scene. Um, 
And it was the, and it was when I realized that uh, you know how good Lauren was as an actress. And there was only one time I was really nervous on set uh, was when we were preparing to do the first kiss. And you know, because Lauren and I both wanted to get it right. And there's so many traps set up for a situation like that in an acting sense where you can either do too little or do too much. So it was the nervousness from both of us was, man, gosh, I hope we get this right. <laughs> what are you doing? Will you just stand still? And then you just sort of lean back on your on your training and your instincts like hey how do i feel about this person how does luke feel about her how would how would he react in this moment i'm very proud of what we did because i thought it was really you know it, it had intensity yet it was soft and tender quotes uh well you know the name of the first episode is red meat can kill you enjoy so <laughs> it says everything about him Red meat can kill you. Enjoy. What inspired me to launch a Gilmore Girls podcast was the fans are clamoring for content. They are clamoring for connection. They want to be inside that show. They want to be involved in the show. We're not making any episodes for them. Uh, it's been four years now, five years now. Uh, since the year in the life, and it's just too long uh, to thirst for the Gilmore drink. And I think any type of uh, comforting voice uh, from the set of the show is going to engage people in a positive way. It's going to support how they feel about the show, their lives. It's going to help them. I mean, fans would love it. And, you know, I, I love chopping it up with the cast members. We always had a lot of fun on set. I thought, well, why not take that? feeling and that vibe to a podcast format and they i heart thought it was a great idea and um here we are you know so it's uh it's it's just a lot of fun and kind of my personal love letter to fans at the end of the day the show makes people happy i mean it's really a simple formula and i think the podcast uh, uh you know the intention of the podcast is to continue to make people happy you know just from a different angle it's you know, watching, I, I watch the episodes that I've never seen before. I invite a guest on, we talk about those episodes and we talk about behind the scenes stuff that nobody knows about, that no one's ever discussed before. So as a character of the show, I've become a fan. So I'm experiencing what the fans are experiencing and it's, and it's really interesting and fun. My favorite episodes to revisit are well, I think the episode where we, we get the name of the podcast from, that, that episode where I, I declare my undying uh, love for her and that I am in, I am all in. Uh, I think the first kiss as well, I think. And I really like the episode where I push Milo in the leg. And where I take the sledgehammer to the wall and say, we'll hold hands and skip. That's your room. Finish up. We'll hold hands and skip afterwards. I enjoyed making them all, but especially that one because it was finally there was something physical to do instead of like spitting out a million words uh, per second. It's so really just all of them, but uh, uh, I mean, you really can't go wrong. I watched the I watched the pilot again after 20 years. I hadn't seen it in 20 years. It's the only show uh, that I watched. Um, and I was delighted. I thought it was just epic. And, you know, how great the acting was and how great the writing was. It was just, I, it was magical. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. Ready actors. An indie horror film, a talented young actress, and a deadly shot. 
Dateline's newest podcast, Killer Roll. Action! Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. It does seem as if this White House doesn't want to bring a lot of high-profile attention to the issue. What efforts might depoliticize vaccine hesitancy? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. Congratulations to Lester Holt, the most trusted TV news anchor in America, on receiving the prestigious Edward R. Murrow Lifetime Achievement Award for a career dedicated to excellence in journalism. What's about to happen on our plaza is you're all going to get your very first COVID vaccine. I'm excited. She's excited. Three, two, one, check. So grateful. Is that close to prom? Here we go. People are particularly stupid today. I can't talk to any more of them. People are particularly stupid today. I can't talk to any more of them. How would I describe Michelle Girard? Um, opinionated. Uh, very specific about what he likes. Um, good hearted. He means well. Excuse me. And there's a phone call for you. And if I'm to fetch you like a dog, I'd like a cookie and a raise. Thanks for the peach. The description for Michelle originally, I think they were looking for someone much older. I want to say 60. Um, and then they didn't find apparently what they were looking for. So um, a friend of a friend thought of me for the part. And it was actually my first audition in LA. And when I read it, it felt very much it was something I could do well. But after the audition, I didn't hear anything for two weeks. And I was like, hmm. All right, I guess I was wrong. So I called the person who booked the appointment and he called and he said, no, 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 we loved him. Uh, he's gonna come back and have an audition and a call back. But yeah, I, I made him what was my vision to uh, a French person coming to America with all of their specific ways that they wanna bring from their own country, but they're in a new culture. So sometimes there's a little clash and um, I thought that was an interesting um, character. My favorite moments for him, there are many, uh, or favorite lines. One line that I really, really thought was funny. People don't mention that line to me, but I think it's a really, really funny line because uh, it's so inappropriate. There was an old lady, I think it's season one, who uh, came to the end and uh, she said, excuse me, sir, do you know where I could find the best antiques? And uh, Michelle's response was at your house, I'd guess. Oh, excuse me, sir. Can you tell me where we can find the best antiques? At your house, I'd guess. And I just thought it was so funny because no one would say that in their right mind. Um, but in the episode, I had a lot of fun. Obviously, the episode of the dogs, but um, the Price is Right episode when he goes to LA and he got veneers and Botox. And I don't know, I thought it was really funny. I got Botox. Ow. Dr. Wu, oh, she's a genius. Everyone goes there. And look, I got them done by the same guy who does Nick Lachey. How was it to work with Lauren? Well, first of all, we became friends very quickly. And I think it shows because we're friends in the show, but we have a love and hate relationship, but it's easier to do when you actually love someone. Uh, and to this day, we're friends. So that's probably one of my best um, takeaway from the show is the friendships that I've created with Lauren, with Kelly Bishop, with Melissa. Um, you know, those friendships are for life and that I'm very grateful for that. How meaningful the show is for people how the show has brought family to watch together, how the show have helped uh, people going through tough times, um, and moms and daughters who have said, oh, this is our quality time together, this is our time together. Um, the show meant a lot for people and uh, it was meaningful, and I think that's, uh, that's a blessing for an actor to have impacted people in that way. And, uh, Anywhere I go in the world, the reaction is the same. So I'm um, grateful for that.
Oh, I haven't told you the most amazing part yet. You got your boobs done by the same guy who did Pamela Anderson? No, though I did meet him at the coffee bean. Why do I think people love Gilmore Girls so much? The writing, the writing is so exquisite. Um, it is not a cynical show. Uh, it is a show with a lot of heart and also, you know, it's a show about family, but family, your real family, but your extended family, your friends that are becoming your family, the town, the people of the town that are your, your family. So it's really very much about family and being there for each other. And I think, uh, especially now, <laughs> in a time where um, people need comfort, um, I think people still resonate with the show for that. It's a, it's a show from the heart, the quality of the writing, uh, it's touching, it's funny, and all of these really unique characters coming together, which is, again, another example of families, you know? We are a bunch of eclectic people coming together, connected by the same DNA, um, and we're making it work. And so I think that's the connection. I don't know, yeah. Where do I think Michelle is up to now? Probably uh, pissed at the kids that are running around and screaming in the house. <laughs> <laughs> on the verge of a nervous breakdown, wanting to move back to Paris, <laughs> questioning his life choices. Um, I don't know. Yeah, probably along those lines. <laughs> right now on NBC News Now. They've done things like installing cameras to help alert Border Patrol to people crossing. They are escaping a number of conditions there, uh, violence and persecution in their home countries. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Right now on NBC News Now. They've done things like installing cameras to help alert Border Patrol to people crossing. They are escaping a number of conditions there, uh, violence and persecution in their home countries. Congratulations to Lester Holt, the most trusted TV news anchor in America, on receiving the prestigious Edward R. Murrow Lifetime Achievement Award for a career dedicated to excellence in journalism. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. How would I describe Emily Gilmore? I used to say Emily Gilmore is a piece of work. She's um, no nonsense. Uh, she's smart. She's uh, conservative. She has values that are very kind of straight-laced. Uh, she's not foolish. She's uh, she's up with current things, but there's a certain uh, value system that she expects people to live by, particularly her daughter. What was my favorite part about Emily? Well, I liked the clothes. Uh, they spent a lot of money on my wardrobe. I liked her attitude. I mean, she was so difficult and demanding and uh, hard to please as far as Lorelei was concerned. Uh, and what I really loved about that whole show was Amy Sherman Palladino's writing because it's some of the best material I've, it's probably the best material I've ever done. And, uh, oh God, amazing. Funny, smart, on top of it, and as everybody knows, really fast. So uh, that was just one of the many favorite things. I love doing that show. Lauren and I, uh, the day we met, it was like, okay, I could do this. 
and she and I became so close and still are close. She really is like a daughter to me and I really am kind of like a mother to her. We don't spend a lot of time, you know, talking to each other or texting or anything like that, but whenever we get together, it just clicks right in again. There's just a real love and trust and and pleasure. You know, we we have the same sense of humor. Uh, yeah, she's she's great. I'm I'm really crazy about Lauren. My all-time favorite episode, actually the one that tickles me the most because it was so different. There was one uh, where uh, Richard, my husband's uh, mother, who was a very difficult woman, uh, had passed away, and uh, I found, if I recall correctly, I found a letter that she had written to him the night before our wedding, I think, begging him not to marry me. I know that the timing of this is particularly awkward since you are to be married tomorrow. No way! But your happiness is too important to me, so timing be damned. She wanted Dad to leave you at the altar. She begged him to leave me at the altar. She begged him in writing, and then she saved the carbon. And uh, that sort of sent me off. He wasn't there to support me because he was so grieving for his mother that during that episode I was drinking. There, I, there was even one scene where I was smoking a cigarette. I, I called it my the Tennessee Williams episode for me. Who was that at the door? It was Jason. Dad needs to sign something. Uh-huh. I mean, she was just out there. She was so un-Emily. Uh, that was great fun. I really had fun doing that one. There were a few episodes that I really liked, but that one was just such a departure. Uh, that and then later um, in those last four episodes that we met, the special four, uh, when I uh, went after the uh, DAR ladies. I rather enjoyed that too. What the hell is going on? I can't do it anymore. Can't do what? I can't spend any more time and energy on artifice and bullshit. Why do you love that word so much? The zingers and the put downs, oh boy. Uh, actually, one of my first ones, one of the reasons I love the pilot script so much, I, I couldn't believe this pilot script when I got it. It was so funny. And I had no idea who any of these people were or, or who the writer was, anything like that. It's when uh, Lorelai comes to see her parents in the pilot script, obviously to ask for money for Rory's education. And uh, I open the door and I said something to the effect of, is it Christmas? Hi, Mom. Lorelai. My goodness, this is a surprise. Is it Easter already? <laughs> or is it Easter? It was some holiday which was indicative of perfect writing of saying that's how often they saw each other. It was on, on holidays, Christmas, Easter, whatever it was. And then Richard, my husband's character, comes in sometime later after we've done this scene and he basically does the same thing with a different holiday. Hi, Dad. What is it? Christmas already? Lorelai was taking a business class at the college today and decided to drop in to see us favorite moments with Ed Herman. I just loved working with him. We really liked each other so much. I know I know. one of my favorite uh, scenes with him was when we did renew our vows and he we danced to the song Bill and he said today I mean, that was your favorite you know your favorite song and today you can call me Bill. Emily would tease me saying if only your name was Bill then this could be our song. <laughs> well Emily for tonight and tonight only my name is Bill, and this is our song. That was wonderful, you know. Uh, he was such a good actor, and very generous, very professional, but just a sweet, good man. Why is it still cooking? First of all, it's very intelligent. I mean, if you the smarter you are, the more you get it. And it's fast, and so you gotta pay attention. You don't have much time to laugh because you gotta catch up with what's going on. Um, it's funny. I mean, it's, it really is a funny show. But what I decided was that there's really an innate sweetness about it, which sounds kind of icky, but it's not that. There's a, there's a decency about it. Um, and one of the things that men started, when men started watching it, which they weren't inclined to because it was Gilmore Girls and all that sort of thing, uh, is that if you look at the male characters in that show, there's no nasty guy, there's no jerk, there's no misogynist, uh, there's no violence. They're just 
trying to make their way in the world like all the rest of us. And so there's uh, what there is basically is an innate decency about these people. They're good people. There's some of them are very strange, but they're they're good. And I heard a wonderful uh, story last year sometime that very often um, when the troops come back from maneuvers in places like Afghanistan and places that we you know hear too much about, they very often sit down and watch Gilmore Girls. And I think it's because it's a feel-good place. It's like, this is what America's supposed to be. This is what, you know, this is what we want it to be, and this is what it was <laughs> and can be again. So there's, there's a real decency about it. There's no, it's not mean-spirited. And I think that's, that's just very appealing. And then on top of that, I just think it's very funny. It's a very funny show. What's about to happen on our plaza is you're all going to get your very first COVID vaccine. I'm excited. She's excited. Three, two, one, champion. So grateful. That close to crime. Here we go. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. Right now on NBC News Now. Here in Chicago, about 20,000 middle schoolers returning to school today. They also took advantage of existing vaccine distribution networks throughout Alaska. I joined Ellen on her set. What's been a difficult year for her personally and for her show. Very few people go through such huge public humiliation. How can I be an example of strength and perseverance if I give up and run away? Congratulations to Lester Holt, the most trusted TV news anchor in America, on receiving the prestigious Edward R. Murrow Lifetime Achievement Award for a career dedicated to excellence in journalism. Bring a lot of money because I'm going to overcharge you like you've never been overcharged before. So there was one line in the script that said, um, I miss my home. And she's looking at the windshield wipers. Gypsy. I miss my home. Put them back. I miss my home, like her home was some village far away. Because it didn't say I miss being at home, it was like I miss my home. So that's when I decided to give her an accent, but from somewhere we don't know where exactly. She's a gypsy. I think gypsy is a no-nonsense, tough businesswoman with a heart of gold. I think gypsy, gypsy likes to uh, give people a hard time, but she really, I think gypsy, if your car was stuck on the side of the road, gypsy would come and give you a tow. Like she would have a, I just knew she, she should have like a big watch and a denim shirt. And I decided to put my hair in pigtails. I don't remember why, but I remember getting to the audition and looking around the room and there were really funny people there. And I just thought I have to distinguish myself from these other people. My very first day on set, what I remember about working with Ed Herman was he was so kind. We had a Michigan connection, so we talked a lot about Mackinac Island and fudge and just like being an actor. And he was just so welcoming and warm and, and it really, it relaxed me. I mean, I remember having to do the scene over and over again and it was cold and it was just so much fun. I, I just, I'm glad that the, that it started with something with the car right away to make me really feel like, okay, this is it. She, she works on cars. But I'm telling you, there's nothing wrong with this car. I am paying you for a service. I would like that service performed. Okay, I look again. I love that. I love that scene with the two windshield wipers because they're both, I think they're both like six, over six feet tall. Ed Herman was very tall. And I'm five foot three and three quarters. Okay, I found something wrong. You did? What? Windshield wipers came right off in my hand. Very dangerous. Thank God I check it again. Gypsy, you broke those off yourself. Yes, I did. So <laughs> it was a lot of fun. I remember the one where Gypsy um, and Andrew have a big fight about parking or something. I loved that one because I love to get really mad at Andrew. That was really fun. And then I looked, backed up. No. I did two back up. You backed up. You didn't look. You got in, you turned on your car, and then you whipped out of that space like you were Lizzie Grubman. Tweet timing or what? Liz Torres and Sally Struthers were just favorite actresses of mine 
growing up. I mean, but I watched them on All in the Family and I was just such a huge fan. So I had to get over being intimidated by like, oh my God, these people, I'm actually gonna be with them. The festival is tomorrow and I have to start squeezing my lemons and I don't have my equipment or my booth. And to this day, fans say to me, they wanted me to say something as Gypsy. I'll say either that, something about lemonade, or um, how can a stupid donut be happy? I think that probably is my favorite line. How can a stupid donut be happy? I love things like that where you're like, oh, you found out that she like has a lemonade stand, you know, can knit, knit a big long sweater. That, that was really fun. Gypsy loved Lorelai and Rory. And I think that they were both so much fun to work with. I got to know them a little more in the revival, I think, because um, in the original, I think I was in maybe, oh, I loved the episode where I had Emily's bachelorette party where I got to go to her house <gasps> and just stand on the porch with Lauren. Gypsy was like in heaven, like, oh. And that's why, and it was one of my favorite lines is, who's Emily? Hey, Gypsy, thanks for coming on such short notice. Hey, I'm always up for a good party. Emily's in the living room with the others. Great. Who's Emily? Follow me up, point her out. Okie dokie. There was a scene where the, they broke up, so the town was split, and we wore pink ribbons or blue ribbons. And I remember having to say, like, Luke fixes his own truck. It was no choice for me. Luke fixes his own truck, so I make buckets off him. But you, you don't know, I pissed him from a pepperon. Like, she didn't care about Luke. But I remember making a decision that Gypsy didn't think Luke was good enough for Lorelei. That Gypsy wanted better for Lorelei. Why do I think Gilmore Girls is so loved? I think that there's a... The world is hard, you know, and there's such a cozy, safe feeling when people check into Stars Hollow. I know I've met people that say, if I've had a long day at work, I turn it on and it's like a cozy blanket, and they feel like it's a little town. I think everyone fantasizes about living in a town where your neighbors kind of know your business, even though it might be annoying, it would still be kind of fun. There's something very comforting about it, and I've met people that actually said that when they were recovering from an illness or you know, going through something really, really difficult, they put it on as this escape because it's so, it's just comforting. And I love the fact that, like when it was on, I don't know if it was super, super popular. I don't think it was. I love being on something that grew in popularity and that's why it is very, it's great that there's streaming services that and DVDs and things that people can watch, you know, that they can get, fall in love with it and turn other people onto it. I meet a lot of men too that say like, oh, my wife liked it, so I started watching it. Now I love it. So I, I love when that happens. Okay, have you ever spotted someone walking down the street, admired their style and thought, how do they make themselves look so fashionable? I know, well, that is exactly what happened with two friends from San Francisco. And that conversation led to a passion project and a book. It's called Chinatown Pretty, celebrating the fashionable seniors living in their neighborhood. Take a look. The Chinatown Pretty style is really this patchwork of contrast a lot of pattern clashing and a big mix of colors. San Francisco-based photographer Andrea Lowe and writer Valerie Liu have always been awed by the eclectic styles of senior citizens in the city's Chinatown. We'd just look at each other and be like, did you see that? Where did they get these articles of clothing and accessories? And how did they, they compose these next level outfits? In 2014, after a dim sum date where they spent more time focusing on the fashionable elders than the food, the two friends started Chinatown Pretty, a project celebrating the street style of seniors living in the neighborhood. That's nice. With a Cantonese translator, the duo takes laps around the area and stop fashionable locals for a photo and an interview. And we'll just say, good morning, Joe san and usually just compliment them on the thing that catched our eye. And from there, you know, we try to ask how their day's going and let the conversation evolve naturally. Jacket's good, it's very warm, very good. And after seven years of doing gallery shows and articles for local magazines, Chinatown Pretty became a book featuring more than 100 senior citizens from six Chinatowns across North America. One person we met, was this woman in a magical alleyway called Ross Alley in San Francisco. And when we asked her to lift up her fleece pants, there are these pink socks that read, my favorite salad is mine, which is like the last thing you would expect on, on someone who's like in their 80s. I think that's a running theme throughout the outfits is um, the element of surprise and delight. Through fashion, Valerie and Andrea were able to connect and unlock countless stories. It's a demographic that doesn't get seen or heard a lot. And, you know, it's important to share their stories. A lot of them have immigrated, leaving their families behind, been through war, are refugees, the list goes on and on. 
and there's so much resilience that we can learn from them. One senior featured in the San Francisco chapter is 87-year-old Dorothy G.C. Kwok, who's also known as Polka Dot. She works as a tour guide and documentary film researcher, and in her free time, distributes food pantry deliveries to neighbors. I mix and match whatever is given to me to make outfits out of them that is comfortable for me. I don't follow any fashion. I have my own fashion. If I'm called Polka Dot, I should have at least one outfit. She was born and raised in Chinatown and she has a lot of history there. It was very difficult because we were discriminated. My father had died when I was 12 years old. With seven siblings, it became very difficult to survive. But I got married after the second year of college and decided to move. But I was determined to come back someday where my roots are. Dorothy was walking me through Chinatown and telling me stories of her childhood there or growing up, and I've learned so much from her. I was so proud and so surprised that people love it. The writing that Valerie has commentaries on really explains a lot about people and really gives a highlight that immigrants especially, they have a life that can be full. The first quarter of 2021 saw a 169% increase in anti-Asian hate crimes. It is Andrea and Valerie's hope that Chinatown Pretty can shine a light on the humanity, understanding, and joy that can occur when we stop and connect with one another. I think that Chinatown Pretty is one example of how we can perhaps change or expand the general public of who and what we are by revealing some of our personal stories that go with the fashion. We are living beings and that we are as human as anyone else. They're in their 80s and 90s and living their best urban lives. They're meeting with friends in the park. They're playing chess. They're watching opera. We go by Popo Holeng, which is, damn grandma, you look good in Cantonese. Damn, Grandma, you look good. They do look that good. is awesome. Oh, God, I hope you guys check this out. Check out Chinatown Pretty. Head to today.com slash shop. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. A huge lift is underway for one of the most celebrated I cities in this country, Cleveland, Ohio. Yes. This is the greatest location in the nation. <laughs> We're having a baby. Wow. The big reveal is under the lid. <laughs> Hey now. Things are looking brighter, so we want to help you find the fun in 21. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Right now on NBC News Now. Here in Chicago, about 20,000 middle schoolers returning to school today. They also took advantage of existing vaccine distribution networks throughout Alaska. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. It does seem as if this White House doesn't want to bring a lot of high-profile attention to the issue. What efforts might depoliticize vaccine hesitancy? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Ready actors. An indie horror film, a talented young actress, and a deadly shot. Dateline's newest podcast, Killer Role. Action! Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Judith has made it her mission to help other women her age find a confident sense of style. For many, the mirror can sometimes spark criticism instead of confidence. Mostly I think about fashion and styles is stuff for other people. It's more, I hope I don't embarrass myself by what I put on. And for some like Joan Marquis, trying to keep up with changing trends can be overwhelming. Judith Rizzio is trying to prove that doesn't need to be the case. I'm not real big on the fashion rules. It's just sort of like waking up and figuring out where am I going today? How do I want to look? To me, it's fun. Judith, a former teacher and artist, has been in love with fashion her whole life. Now a self-proclaimed style activist, she believes everyone has the right to feel confident in clothing. You want to make fashion accessible to everyone. That's the key word. Our culture has such an idea around who has the privilege and the right 
to enjoy fashion. You know, if you're not the right size, if you're not the right age, uh, or don't have the right amount of money. A year ago, the 65-year-old fashionista launched Out of Our Closet, an affordable styling service based in Portland that helps women over 50 transform their wardrobe and their lives. Out of Our Closet is designing a personal fashion style so you don't disappear. And it's not just disappearing on the outside. How does it, yeah, do, do that. It's Let's that start. sense of disappearing Let's put it within yourself. The loop. And I get really emotional about that at times because I just see that happen so much. How are you? It's why she wants to help Joan rediscover her sense of style, beginning inside her closet. The idea that I get to uh, dive in there and make some changes is, is what I do and what I love to do with you today, okay? Okay. All right. You're a breast cancer survivor. Did that in some way impact your sense of you know what you get out of clothing? Having gone through the experience mm -hmm. made me want to hide more. Mm -hmm. Don't notice me, don't notice what they did, let's just move on kind mm -hmm. of a feeling. But we gotta celebrate <laughs> that you're six years cancer free. Okay. It's time to have some presence in the world and we can do that with fashion. Rizzio suggests getting rid of anything that is ill-fitted and dated. Are you ready to try some things on and see what we can put together for you? I'm ready. We, I say we. It's all her. <laughs> Next stop, shopping. Ooh, it fits you just right. Judith's rules for success, you don't need to spend a lot of money to look good. There are clothes out there that look a lot more expensive than they are, you know, being in a store, and that's fun. Take a chance by stepping out of your comfort zone. Give a twirl, give a You're twirl, You're like girl. swinging Woo! into the party. Oh my, oh my gosh. gosh. I'm willing to try probably most of what Judith will suggest. So I trust her. That doesn't mean I'm going to wear it out in public, but I'll try it. <laughs> but most importantly, wow. stay true to yourself. It feels like you. It really yeah, does. This does. It does. Working with Judith has given me more confidence and creativity. Now I feel better about myself. It's okay to be out in the world. It's okay to be noticed because that's a good thing. I just want women to realize no matter who you are, you have the right to that. Feeling good in yes. yourself and feeling confident Ooh, and nice. feeling hot in your clothes or whatever you want to feel um, is good, good medicine. Yes. This is so fun! I love it. Oh. Well, believe it or not, most of the outfits in Judith's closet are thrifted. She says it's important, again, for fashion to be fun but affordable. That is the key. And that's why she provides her services at a very low cost, sometimes even for free. Harper's Bazaar is here to help us with our skincare needs. They mm. called up a who's who of dermatologists and came up with a list of expert approved products for their annual anti-aging awards. Yeah. That's right, and here to walk us through some of the winners is director Jessica Matlin, and we've got our trusty QR code in the corner there as well, so you can shop along as we go. Jessica, it's good to have you up on The Connection yeah. this morning. Good, good morning. Good Where do you morning, want to start? Good morning, Jessica. Let's, let's start with it this. great we, to be here. <laughs> we need a clean palette to begin, all right? We need to start off fresh. So what's your best cleanser? So we love this CeraVe cleanser. It is what a is cream to foam cleanser, and I love that you get that really hydrating feeling from the ceramides, and you also get that refreshing foaming feeling. And CeraVe is so hot right now that, I mean, this brand is on fire, and I have to tell you, the price is right. Yeah, eleven ninety nine. Yeah, and Craig uses yeah. that's yeah, that's mine. yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's like yeah you get it right yeah. at the drugstore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think all the supermodels like Craig use it. <laughs> okay, what about a serum? Yeah, because those serums can oh. have all kinds of good ingredients in them. Okay, so serums, yeah, this is your action pack. Like, this is the step really worth adding. And we have two here. We have one from Estee Lauder and one from Drunk Elephant. And oh. Estee Lauder, you may recognize this one because it's the top mm -hmm. serum in the country. Mm -hmm. And this is great for all skin types, all you know, all ages, and it's going to really address a multitude of skin of um, anti-aging concerns. The Drunk Elephant one, you're going to get 
retexturizing. It's going to improve your skin tone. It's mm. going to help plump your skin. It's going to get that bounce back. I love it. Carson wants the drunk elephant. Okay, uh, <laughs> moisturizers. <laughs> we got you. Got a couple that we need. We need one that's for the face and one for those uh, the soft skin around the eyes. Okay. Drunk Elephant, I'm sorry, not Drunk Elephant. <laughs> These are both drugstore ones. I'm still stuck on Drunk Elephant because that <laughs> name is like gets in your head, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Aven is a great French brand and you can get it at the drugstore. So it's like, ooh la la, you feel a little like fancy. But this is your SOS cream for when you have any redness. So whether you, you know, kind of overdid it on the at-home facials, I know I did this pandemic, uh, or you just have sensitive skin, it is a beautiful cream that is going to take down any redness. Rock is the leader in retinol, mm -hmm. and if you have, if you're noticing a little extra crow's feet from all of these zooms, just put it under your eyes. You're going to see results in four weeks, but in 12 weeks, boom, you're really going to notice a difference. Just an under eye cream. It really takes away the wrinkles. Take, put that one. To it's the real. Retinol it's is proven to help. Okay. Proven to help with uh, reducing wrinkles. Or the appearance of wrinkles. Yeah. The, way they that. the, <laughs> <laughs> the appearance of wrinkles, but it really does make a difference. So yeah, retinol is your best friend mm -hmm. in that department. Okay. Now let's get to some really fun stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lip masks. Lip masks are fantastic for. I mean, it, like it sounds like it's complicated. It really is just a souped up lip balm. I keep one by my bedside. I love this Laneige lip sleeping mask in the sweet candy flavor. It's fantastic for really hydrating the lips. You really need that year round, whether it's air conditioning, mm -hmm. heating. Mm -hmm. It's a really fun little lip treat and it tastes good. It's like a little dessert. Okay. Oh, I like both and of those. And you sleep with it on your lips all night? Yeah, all it's, right. it, it's okay. just really like an extra, you know, souped up lip cream, okay. lip balm. All what right. about now, the peel? Dr. I Dick, love to Yeah, the peel, you? yes. Okay. Peel sounds kind of scary. It's really just a fantastic exfoliator. This is a two-step. Dr. Dennis Gross is one of the top dermatologists in New York City. He's famous for his in-office peel, but now you can get really amazing results with this one at home. One step, two step, no muss, no fuss. It doesn't hurt. It's really gentle and you can use it every day. It's just like a very quick and easy clean pad to use like every single day. And you're wow. gonna notice a nice fresh spring glow. We all have dull skin from being inside. I mean, I've been inside for like a year now. You're yeah. just gonna get that bright, yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. You're gonna get a bright, fresh glow. Real quick, and just, uh, just a quick shout out for sunscreen. We just have a couple of seconds left. Okay, sunscreen. You need it. We all need it. L to MD, absolute germ favorite, Harper's Bazaar favorite. It goes missing in the office. <laughs> it is the best. All mm -hmm. skin tones. You're going to love it. Harper's Bazaar beauty director, Jessica Madeline, bringing the heat this morning. Good Thank recovery, you, Jessica. Jessica. Thanks, Jessica. Congratulations to Lester Holt, the most trusted TV news anchor in America, on receiving the prestigious Edward R. Murrow Lifetime Achievement Award for a career dedicated to excellence in journalism. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, that's your shop today with Joe Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. What's about to happen on our plaza is you're all gonna get your very first COVID vaccine. I'm excited. She's excited. Three, two, one, one. Oh. So grateful. That close to crime. Here we go. Right now on NBC News Now. Here in Chicago, about 20,000 middle schoolers returning to school today. They also took advantage of existing vaccine distribution networks throughout Alaska. Our week-long journey begins here in Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky. in Cleveland. Our Across America journey, reporting on an America rebuilding and reimagining a future after the pandemic. Breaking news tonight, the ceasefire in the Middle East after 11 days of deadly violence. Richard Engel is on the ground. Do you think there's a connection between policing and racism? How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Right now on NBC News Now. They've done things like installing cameras to help alert Border Patrol to people crossing. They are escaping a number of conditions there, uh, violence and persecution in their home countries.
getting older can leave a lot of us feeling a little uncomfortable. But lucky for us, acclaimed journalist, author, activist, and longtime friend of the Today Show, Joan London, wrote a new book. I love the title. Why did I come into this room? A candid conversation about aging. Joan, good morning. Have you seen my glasses lately? I can't find them anywhere. Oh, I know. <laughs> I mean, that's what we're talking about. We get older and suddenly we kind of feel like, am I losing it? Why did I walk into See, this room? See, if you're in your 20s and you can't find something, you don't think anything about it because you're not programmed to worry. But once you're in your 40s, 50s, and you start, like, coming out of the mall saying, where did I park my car? Yes. Or oh looking for your glasses, and you go all over, you look in every coat pocket, and then you realize they're on your face? Yes, yes. <laughs> Been there, done that. Now, it's, it's interesting because, as I understand it, you decided to write this book, and it kind of sprung from an appearance on the Today Show a couple years back. Well, I was doing a special series for the show on the value of friendships and companionship, which is even more important as we get older. And I had an interview with The Hollywood Reporter, a phone interview, to, talk, you know, to promote the series. And this guy answered. I could tell he was young when he answered. <laughs> but his first question was, what's it like now going back to morning TV as a senior citizen? That was his first question. <laughs> Were you like, wait, who is the senior wait, citizen? Like, what? Who are you talking about? This is Joan London. And I, it just like stopped me in my tracks. But it started me thinking about, is that how I'm perceived now because of my age? And why are we so tied to age? If you have four women that are all 62, they're probably incredibly different. And the worst description is that they're 62. The danger is that when we start thinking of ourselves as that age, yes. sometimes we start to think that we are less capable, that we can have less things we can expect to happen in our lives. Actually, telling someone's age is the least descriptive thing you yes, could really say absolutely. about them when you think about it. You actually say in the book to, to think about what age you feel. Yes. And everybody's got a number in their head. Do you yeah. have a number? I, I guess I do. What's I, your number? I mean, I might say like 38 or something. That's a very normal. Which I would like that. Mine's but frankly, 45. I like being four. I mean, I'm in my 40s. I'm 48. I love being it's in my 40s. It's usually 10 years younger, though. Oh, as so. to how your brain <laughs> yes. thinks of yourself. Yeah. What do you think women are most reluctant to talk about when it comes oh. to aging? You know, there are so many things that happen to women that don't happen to men because of declining estrogen. Yeah. And I mean, you're. You, besides the hot flashes, people tend to say the okay talking about hot flashes, but in regards to someone else having them. Yes. But there are so many other things. Um, and I mean, leaky bladders. Yeah. You know, discomfort in sex. I mean, there's the inability to sleep, a loss of libido, expanding waistlines. These things are annoying. But, and they're worrisome to a woman because so often we just think it's happening to us. Like, what's wrong with me? And the next thing is, is to say, oh, I'm not as appealing. I'm not as desirable. And then, you know, it kind of goes down that track. If we just stop letting these things be taboo. Yeah. And we all started talking about them because they happen to everyone. Why don't we all just talk about it? You have, there's so many, there's just like lovely little nuggets. I think this will really make people feel good when they read this book. You have some, um, you have like a list. It's called Decline to Decline. Yep. And it embodies your attitude so we can actually go through them. One of them, I like this, get in the sunshine and fresh air. Well, you know, interestingly, isolation, according to experts, is as dangerous to your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Wow. And so it sounds mundane and like so simplistic, but getting out. Take a little walk, even if take your a back walk. hurts or whatever, just a little bit. And, you know, they say the three things that will really predict how well you age are staying engaged in life, mm -hmm. having social connections, join clubs, get yeah. friends. So you, when you wake up in the morning, you have somebody to talk to and to relate to and share things with. And the last thing is having a sense of purpose. Yeah. So, and you don't have to join some big club or something, just do a good deed. Um, yeah. You know, there's a lot like of ways to accomplish it. I like you put energy in your voice. Oh. Why do you say that? Because while some people get louder because they can't hear, women especially, they start to talk so, more mm. softly. And you become meek, you become, uh, unengaged and you, they say sing at home. Hmm. You, don't, you don't have to do it out in public, yeah. just at home. But if you sing, it's hard to sing to a song in a whisper. Yeah. So it like lets you bring your voice out and that really engages you again in life and it's so important to be an active member of life. Well, like I said, there's a lot that's really fun in this book. It's uh, you get good information, but it's got such a nice, light, warm heart about it. I don't know if you've gotten to the last chapter, but it's 
I want to be cremated. It's my last chance for a smoking hot body. Our across America journey here in Louisville, Orlando, Kentucky. In Cleveland. Reporting on an America rebuilding after the pandemic. How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. right. Are you ready? Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. A huge lift is underway for one of the most celebrated cities in this country, Cleveland, Ohio. Yes. This is the greatest location in the nation. <laughs> We're having a baby. Wow. The big reveal is under the lid. <laughs> hey, now. Things are looking brighter, so we want to help you find the fun in 21. The music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. I joined Ellen on her set, what's been a difficult year for her personally and for her show. Very few people go through such huge public humiliation. How can I be an example of strength and perseverance if I give up and run away? There's a saying that aging is a fact of life, but what if it didn't have to be? Yeah, it may sound like science fiction, but our next guest says ending aging. That's right. Ending aging hmm. is reality that's closer than you might think. Andrew Steele is a computational biologist, hmm. but he's also the author of the new book. It's called Ageless, the new science of getting older without getting old. Andrew, good morning. Al Roker's been waiting on this segment <laughs> I'm you. All, all month. That's right. It's coming for you guys. Too. Uh, get ready. Hey, so attention. here's the thing, Andrew. You say that aging isn't inevitable, and one of the ways that we, we can stop it is by targeting Senescent cells? What, what, what are those cells which are actually happening in the science of aging? And why aren't we talking more about that? Yeah, I think a lot of us think that the aging process is this inevitable fact of life, that as we get older, we inevitably get a higher risk of disease, we get wrinkles, we get gray hair. But actually, by targeting the hallmarks of the aging process, the underlying cellular and molecular causes of aging, we can slow it down globally. And yeah. senescent cells that you mentioned are a great example. They're something that accumulate in all of our bodies as we get older. And they don't just sit there sort of benign old cells. They actually emit a toxic cocktail of molecules that effectively accelerate the aging process. Now, that sounds like bad news, but the good news is that we've got drugs that can target these cells. You can kill the senescent cells and leave the rest of the cells in your body unharmed. And if we give these drugs to mice aged about 24 months, and that's about 70 years old in human terms, these mice basically get biologically younger. What? They live a couple of years longer, which is a good, good, good start. But they also get less cancer. They get less heart disease. They get less cataracts. They can run further and faster on a little mousy treadmill they use in these experiments. <laughs> they even have better fur. These animals just look great. So what this is showing us is that by targeting these senescent cells and other hallmarks of aging too, we can really globally affect the aging process. And what I'm most excited about with these senolytic drugs, as they're called, is there are already 20 or 30 companies trying to turn this from something that's on the lab bench to something that's actually in I human beings. Are. Clinical trials are happening now. So this could be with us in the next few years. So I imagine this kind of works out where, you know, if, if you have a pill that extends your life a little bit longer and then you live a little bit longer, then technology improves so that you can live longer than that. So I I mean, it's it's not totally wild that we could just not age, right? Yeah, I like to talk about a cure for aging, which is quite a bold thing to talk about, right? But I don't imagine that as a single miracle pill that are all going to pop and suddenly live forever. Yeah. What's going to happen is it's going to be a succession of technological change. So, you know, say you take one of these early senolytic treatments, that might add a few years to your lifespan. And what that means is that scientists then have those few years to develop another treatment that might target another hallmark of aging. And then maybe that adds another few years to your life. And eventually we're going to get to a point where technology is moving forward fast enough that your funeral is sort of disappearing over the horizon faster than you can chase it. And so that's what I mean by a cure for aging, not a single pill, but a whole mm -hmm. constellation of treatments targeting these hallmarks. Hmm. But, but there are things that we can do now that are not necessarily all that, that technological that we can actually do to, to extend our, our lifespan. 
definitely and there's nothing like, like writing a book about aging to really make you focus on health advice there's actually a chapter of health advice in the book and i mean the first motivation is that if you live long enough in good health you could live to a point where you could benefit from some of these treatments so that's mm-hmm. really exciting but the second thing is that looking at some of these bits of advice well, let's give some examples there are things like you know not eating too much not smoking making sure you get enough exercise making sure you get enough sleep these are all fairly basic bits of health advice that most of us know but actually once you understand something about aging biology you realize that you're not just you know targeting one particular disease you're actually slowing down the aging process globally so that's made me much more excited about these you know seemingly basic sounding bits of advice can we, hey, then, Andrew, can you, i'm just curious brush your, brush your teeth i saw that what how does that help you you extend your life yeah, so one of the other things is that understanding aging biology really illuminates some less conventional bits of health advice. Um, and brushing your teeth is one of them. So we know that brushing your teeth and basically maintaining good dental hygiene can reduce something called chronic inflammation, which we know mm-hmm. contributes to the whole panoply of the aging process. And so, you know, when you brush your teeth, you're getting rid of those bacteria in your mouth, you're reducing inflammation, and that can reduce your risk of heart disease. It can possibly even, the science is still coming in, but maybe reduce your risk of dementia. So what this shows you is that, you know, brushing, flossing every day, as I now do religiously, it's not just going to reduce your dental bills, it can potentially slow down the whole aging process. Wow, and get, so this way you don't ever have to see your dentist, because nobody likes their <laughs> dentist. Right. You know, Everybody it's, hates their it's, dentist. It's such a fascinating conversation. I mean, we've been talking about the fountain of youth since before any of us were sitting here. What is our takeaway, Andrew, for people who are listening to this topic of, of conversation when it comes to aging? What do you want people to know? I think the single most important thing is that we need to raise the profile of okay. this field of biology because it's just so exciting. Um, you know, we've got a, a, the way that we do medicine at the moment is that we treat individual end stages of the aging process. We treat cancer, we treat heart disease, we treat dementia, and we do all that in silos. But the promise of this field is that we'll be able to develop preventative treatments that will stop aging and stop us getting ill in the first place. Yeah. And I think this could be the greatest revolution in healthcare since the discovery of antibiotics. So I want everyone to be talking about it. I want to talk about it in you know bars and dinner parties. I was just about to say. I would oh, love to sit next to you at a dinner party. Andrew, just not to be a buzzkill, yeah. what about the ethical concerns? Like folks yeah. who would be watching or listening and who would say, human and beings it's, aren't, it's, aren't designed to live forever. We're supposed to participate in this cycle of life. You, <laughs> no, you're I'm born, you live, and you die. Also, it's also Green Week. I mean, can the Earth sustain population? A, I mean, a couple of years. Can I just have an forever. extra couple of years? What say you to that, Andrew? These are really fascinating questions. Actually, I think the most common question I get is, can the Earth sustain this level of population? The fact is, you've got to look at what's on the other side of the balance sheet here. Aging, I characterize in the book, as the world's biggest humanitarian challenge. Of the 150,000 people who die every day, 100,000 of them, so two thirds, die because of aging. They die of the cancer, the heart disease, the dementia that the aging process causes. So this is the world's biggest cause of suffering, I would contend. Mm. And if we can remove that, but we have to work a bit harder sorting out climate change, or there are, you know, there are some social issues, these are things we're going to have to work through. But this is such a huge potential benefit, I just can't see there's an argument against it, to be honest. We are grateful that Harry Smith is with us this morning to share it. Hey, buddy. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Savannah. Good morning, Harry. <laughs> Good to see each other yet. Uh, you know, when you think about it, you spe- think about world history. The world can be uh, an ugly, brutal, even evil place to be. And if you're a person who has endured some of that, a lot of that, and to come away and say you're the happiest person in the world, we thought, we got to meet this guy. Mm. My dear new friends. With a ready smile and a twinkle in his eye, a man of indeterminate age holds his audience spellbound. I was at the bottom of the pit, so if I can make one miserable person smile, I'm happy. (laughs) Eddie JQ describes himself as the happiest man in the world. We wonder if perhaps he is also the wisest. I do not hate anyone. Hate is a disease which may destroy your enemy, but will also destroy you in the process. His 2019 TED Talk in Sydney, Australia, ended with a standing ovation. When we spoke with the 101-year-old recently, we were equally impressed. Where there is life is hope. If there's no more hope, you're finished. Dismissible bromides from a harmless old-timer, these are not. Eddie JQ was born Eddie Jakubowicz in Germany. He is a Holocaust survivor. This is me 
when I came back. I read your book. It sounds to me like you are very proud to be German. Very proud, because I thought I live in the most civilized, most cultured, and certainly the most educated country in Europe. And I was German first, and German second, and Jewish at home. None of which mattered to a nation, a people gone mad. People, society should not forget what happened. I don't hate no one, not even the German, but I despise them. Six million Jews worked to death, starved to death, tortured and murdered. What I have seen, it is incredible. I tell this to people, but they don't want to believe it. I was finally transported to what became my hell on earth, Auschwitz. My parents and sister were also transported to Auschwitz, and I was never to see my parents again. In his book, The Happiest Man on Earth, Eddie Jakey recounts his survival and then misery after the war, until he and his wife started a family. Through all my years, I have learned this life can be beautiful if you make it beautiful. 80 years ago, I didn't think I will have a wife and children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. And this is a blessing. Family, he says, is key as our friends. Friendship is priceless. Shared sorrow is half sorrow, but shared pleasure is double. <laughs> Truths hard earned from a man entitled to bitterness and resentment. I speak about happiness. I speak what life can be. If you're healthy, you're a multi-millionaire. And that is happiness, says Eddie, a choice available to all of us. I want to make this world a better place for everyone. I want everyone to take a step back and say, we are here for all of us. What a message in this time oh. as we're all in a kind of a state of recovery. You mm -hmm. see what this man endured. He walks into Auschwitz with his parents. He never sees them oh. again. Mm. Never sees them again. I want that book. I want to take that book off your lap. <laughs> and there's a lot of pages <laughs> oh, marked and yeah. oh, underlined. Beautiful. Yeah, great beautiful. stuff. And what he said about friendship yeah. as well. Uh, we should mention that uh, Eddie's book, The Happiest Man on Earth, that book is out right now. Yeah. Yeah. Thank he you. can have love in his heart, surely yeah. everyone can. Yeah. Right? Can I read one Amazing. little section? Yes, please. Please. A second? Okay. He says, life is not always happiness. Sometimes there are many hard days, but you must remember that you are lucky to be alive. We are lucky in this way. Every breath is a gift. Life is beautiful if you let it be. Mm. Happiness is in your hands. Mm. Your hands. That's good. <laughs> Our week-long journey begins here in Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky. In Cleveland. Our Across America journey, reporting on an America rebuilding and reimagining a future after the pandemic. Breaking news tonight, the ceasefire in the Middle East after 11 days of deadly violence. Richard Engel is on the ground. Do you think there's a connection between policing and racism? How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now, it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. This is about 50 votes. If you can't get bipartisanship here, where are you going to get it? If China decided to cover this up, can we ever actually get a definitive answer? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. right. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. In February of 1965, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stopped through a little speck of a town in Alabama called G's Bend. That night he told the crowd, 
most of them direct descendants of slaves who had worked the land there, quote, I've come over here to G's Bend to tell you, you are somebody. Boy, was he right. For generations, the women of G's Bend have been making beautiful quilts that have hung in museums across the country and now are earning the artists their due. NBC's Blaine Alexander has our Sunday Spotlight. If you drive too fast, you could almost miss G's Bend, Alabama. There is just one main road. Population doesn't even hit 300. But it holds a tradition so sacred, it's woven into the very fabric of this former plantation. It's a fun thing having a bunch of us quilt together because uh, we can talk about things. Here, quilting is basically a birthright. You're raised under the quilt first because when you're young, after you start walking or whatever they tell you, get under that quilt because they're quilting. Mary Margaret Petway got the gift from her mother. When I was growing up, we took it for granted. Everybody had to keep warm, so everybody made quilts. We didn't know that they were works of art. Sure, you've likely never been to G's Bend. But if you think that you've never seen these works of art, think again. That famous portrait of Michelle Obama? Check out the pattern on her skirt. The quilts have been displayed in Atlanta's High Museum of Art and even the Met. My mother's quilt is hanging in the Met. They got this quilt here hanging up here, out, you know. And I'm going, I remember when I used to sleep under this thing. It's just shocked me because people actually see these quilts and talk about how much they are works of art. I never saw it. Despite that acclaim, G's Bend is a town still steeped in poverty. When we were growing up, seriously, everybody had a lot of nothing. But that started to change when recently these colorful creations caught the eye of Rebecca Van Bergen. Her organization, Nest, supports artists and creatives all over the world. It's also important to remember that the G Spend quilters are incredible, but they're part of a much larger community of very talented black, brown, indigenous makers all over this country that deserve this type of recognition. Now that recognition comes with the launch of a new Etsy shop, transforming these artists into entrepreneurs, some quilts fetching more than $10,000. It's overwhelming. Every, just about every store on Etsy is empty. Did you see these as voices that had been almost silenced for so long? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think that um, most certainly if they had been white quilters in, a, in their age and time, their rise in notoriety and e the economic benefit would have been much, much faster. You know, the reward for quilting, the end product. Everything else is truly icing on the cake, and some of it's got cherries on top. But the end product, you take time and get your hand and you rub it across that quilt. You kind of feel like quilt come to life. A new life for these priceless patterns, now bringing history and art to market. For Sunday Today, Blaine Alexander, Atlanta. Their work is beautiful. Blaine, thank you very much. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends at Today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show. In a mere 30 minutes. Oh, boom. Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. right. Are you ready? Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. A huge lift is underway for one of the most celebrated Are cities in this country, Cleveland, Ohio. Yep. This is the greatest location in the nation. <laughs> We're having a baby. Wow. The big reveal is under the lid. <laughs> Hey now. Things are looking brighter, so we want to help you find the fun in 21. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? 
Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Tonight, the CDC's new outdoor mask guidelines. What change that allowed this new recommendation to be made? If we do nothing, what happens to a city like Houston? You're going to repeat this movie over and over again. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. We're back with a lot more from Cleveland as Al turns his attention to the restaurant restart there. Good eats there. Mm -hmm. Hell, you betcha, Savannah. You know better than most when we were here back in 2016. But like many restaurants, there's a special place here that's been forced to think outside the box to make very different uh, decisions during difficult times. And as you're about to see, at Edwin's Restaurant, they're doing it with equal parts food and purpose that makes them a standout among Cleveland's top culinary destinations. In the hospitality business, First impressions are all important. Here at Edwin's Restaurant on Shaker Square, at the border of Cleveland and Shaker Heights. I want you to miss this out, okay? Owner Brandon Trostowski bets on that success every Six single day. A reminder about winning is written high above the kitchen staircase. When you first look, you see a fine dining restaurant. But look a little closer, and it's a restaurant that offers more than French cuisine. It offers second chances. I received a break when I was 18 going on 19, and the judge gave me probation instead of a long sentence. And from there, I uh, found a chef who mentored me. And from there, I changed my stars. So we're getting closer. And the stars of many others. Trostowski, having worked in Michelin-starred kitchens in Paris and New York, decided to create the Edwin's Leadership and Restaurant Institute. It hit me that I have to give this break back. Edwin's, short for Education Wins. It's a six-month culinary training program specifically designed for formerly incarcerated men and women. We're not asking about what you did. Whatever it may be, we're looking at taking you to where you want to go. Applications pour in from all around the country. Folks eager to learn the nuts and bolts about the industry. You're going to learn every position in the restaurant, dining room and kitchen. Camelia Prosser is a student in the program. Rufus Hill, a seven-year alum who recently joined the kitchen line as a sous chef. Both saying the program is no cakewalk. I was frustrated at times. It was times I wanted to quit. But just people here that's like, it's more than just like co-workers. They like really passionate about helping people. What does distillation actually mean? It takes a lot of hard work. It's worth it. It's not easy, but it's, it's as hard as you make it. Water boils at 212. There it is. Camelia, a mom of two, is studying wine and spirits, grateful for the opportunity to put their past behind them and look forward to the future. You know, we're not the ones that society is really looking at to succeed. You know, but Brandon and his staff, they, they made it a way where not only do you come and get educated, but you get a sense of guidance. Within the last decade, the school has grown into a campus with a bakery and a butcher shop offering free student housing and recreation. 95% of the graduates coming out of here are walking right into a job. And right now we have a waiting list of probably 45 restaurants who want to hire a grad. The rate at which you return back to prison nationally is nearly 50% or less than 1%. What fulfills me and what makes me excited every day is someone being alive, someone surviving, and someone achieving their, their goal. That's all I need. And joining us now is Edwin's owner, Brandon Trosowski, and two of his employees, uh, Azare Davis and Justin Smith. Good morning. Thanks for being here, guys. Good morning, Al. Good morning. Thank, Thank you. Pleasure. So, so uh, I, I know you guys go by Ray and Jay, so we'll, <laughs> we'll go by that. Uh, uh, so, so, Ray, let me ask you first. What was this like? What does this, this opportunity mean for you? Um, it means a lot for me. It's uh, opening up new doors, learning new skills. Um, Definitely structure, discipline for me. So it's just, it's a big experience for me, something different. And Jay, how has this changed your life? Tremendously, actually. Um, I just recently been released and, and 
from prison and because of this man and his program, uh, seeing second chances of just being, uh, giving me a second chance. Uh, and because of Brandon, I'm home today. Uh, so this has it, changed my life and my outlook of what I want to do in life. Uh, and I got goals and focusing on my, my business myself. Because this Brandon, man. This, I mean, you, you're, you're helping dreams come true. Sure. Uh, uh, most people wouldn't think you could pull this off while you're doing <laughs> fine French dining. Yeah. Well, hey, a couple reasons. One, it's um, it's what I know best, right? Uh -huh. But uh, most importantly, it's what we can all aspire to, right? I mean, there's greatness inside all of us. So all it takes is that chance and that and that proper training. And Absolutely. you know, Azure and and Justin can attest to that. Yes. Give the chance, give the guidance, and, and we can hit that mark. What's some of the stuff you've got here? Well, you know, hey, listen, Al, some say it's a mirror that reflects your soul. Uh -huh. but, but actually, a little bit of rabbit right in front of you there. We sure. have the scalps with, with, with the zoto. Ooh. We have the frog legs or cuisa granui and the artichokes. And under that dome uh -huh. is our chocolate pyramid if you want to do the big reveal. Ooh. <laughs> well, hold on a sec. We, make sure you dip it in there. Guys. That's pure chocolate. I had the Tommy's chocolate shake, and now I've got the chocolate pyramid. <laughs> wow. There you are. And that's why this is the greatest location in the nation. <laughs> Brandon, Azare, Justin, thank you. Thank, thank you. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. I joined Ellen on her set. What's been a difficult year for her personally and for her show. Very few people go through such huge public humiliation. How can I be an example of strength and perseverance if I give up and run away? Right now on NBC News Now. They've done things like installing cameras to help alert Border Patrol to people crossing. They are escaping a number of conditions there, of uh, violence and persecution in their home countries. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Today, our search for kindness takes us to the story behind a life-changing wish. Justin Wang from Pleasanton, California, spent much of his childhood in and out of hospitals. So when the Make-A-Wish Foundation gave him the chance to pursue one of his passions, Justin jumped, and now he's paying it forward. Take a look. My love for food comes from my love for creativity. I think everyone loves food, whether it's cooking it or just eating it. It's one of life's simple joys. 18-year-old Justin Wang doesn't take life's simple joys for granted. Throughout his childhood, he dealt with chronic heart failure, which affected his overall health. Being a kid and having to deal with heart failure was very very impactful towards my life. It made me different from my peers and my classmates. He has to go to uh, hospitals and do procedures, and sometimes he couldn't go to school just because of a uh, simple flu cold. In 2018, Justin's health took a drastic turn, and he needed a heart transplant to save his life. That was an incredibly soul-shattering moment for me just because it turned everything upside down. Thankfully, just two weeks later, in the middle of the night, Justin got great news from his parents, Yang and Lin Wang. They told me, they have a heart waiting for you. They had a heart waiting for you. I was like, no way, but it was real. I think the hospital was a little bit more beautiful that night. To me, it's like a miracle. It's a precious gift from our donor. Following the surgery, Justin experienced great pain, but found joy in watching cooking videos from content creators like Claire Saffitz. Can I say it? Action. 
and Rie McClenney. Today, it's going to be just me cooking. And cooking quickly became a part of his recovery. The doctor come in and look at him. Oh, Justin, what is cooking today? So they would uh, exchange the recipes, what they like to eat. At the time, going to walk to the pots and pans, going to get ingredients from the fridge was exercise for myself. Cooking really helped me with post-transplant recovery. During this time, he was granted a wish with the Make-A-Wish Foundation, and he had the perfect idea. When you do have a transplant, you have a special diet. So I wish for a cookbook, a heart-healthy cookbook, that I could use and bring to my own health and bring to my own recovery. So the Make-A-Wish Foundation paired Justin with chef Victoria La Cuesta, a personal chef who specializes in healthy eating. He loves Asian cuisine. Asian cuisine is very salty. And, and one of the things I kind of try to work with him and his mom was introducing low sodium ingredients and making things more flavorful. She taught me that you can actually use less soy sauce and you can always incorporate veggies. I think that those are the most important and valuable lessons I learned from her, and I still use those techniques to this day. When I see other people eating my food and enjoying it, you know, it's like, gosh, yes! It's an amazing feeling. Today, Justin and Yang continue to work with Make-A-Wish to grant wishes to kids just like him. Make-A-Wish is able to give us something good in this world, and I think that's very important because we can't lose hope while fighting these diseases. Justin has changed his character tremendously from before the transplant, before Make-A-Wish, to what he is now. It's just uh, unbelievable. I am so grateful to my donor. Every breath I take and every moment that I do is because of them and their generous gift. And we are so happy because Aww. Justin is here. Our studio is a little brighter with you in it, Justin. <laughs> Hi, Justin. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Hello, you guys. Justin, what we love, we're great because you're here, but what we love is that <laughs> your life changed and instead of just taking, you've decided to give back. How awesome is Make-A-Wish to you? It's really an amazing organization. I feel just blessed being a part of it and blessed being a part of the community that Make-A-Wish provides for me and other Wish kids. Well, I think it's it's amazing. And by the way, this heart healthy business of giving back is brilliant. You've got three good looking meals. What do you have in front of you? So I have my chicken chow mein that's heart healthy, my pan set, mm -hmm. and my soba noodles of tofu. Yum. Can we have those? We want them all. Can you Please. pass them through the Zoom? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, I will. I will pass them. Uh, thank you. Give it to you. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Justin. Well, Justin, we wanted to share a little something with you. Subaru mm -hmm. of America admires your commitment to make a wish of the Greater Bay Area. So they're donating $11,000 to help you grant more wishes. Go, Justin. Oh, Go, my Justin. God. What do you think? How is that gonna help? That means just so much to me. Thank you so much. Oh. I, I, I'm speechless. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, oh, that's amazing. Thank you so much. And Make-A-Wish really deserves this money. They are such an amazing organization. I cannot thank you enough. Oh. Well, Justin, we think you're amazing. Uh, keep doing good work, okay? I will try to make you, you guys you, proud. Oh, you are. You are. <laughs> you are. All right, let's check out Justin's <laughs> recipes. Go to today.com slash food. And for his cookbook, Justin's Heart hearty recipes head to today.com yes i know what shop. i'm gonna get we need Me we too. all need that book thank you so much justin they would just make jokes and say well we had to get a pretty one so we had to step outside to get a pretty one in the family growing up lisa wright always knew she belonged you knew you were adopted right yeah my mom told me and your mommy loved you she was really young and she knew she couldn't take care of you. I wanted a baby so bad, that's why your mom let me take care of you. You weren't abandoned, this was just the best thing for you. Her adoption records were sealed and Lisa never tried to find her biological family. It's done in complete secrecy, so she had no idea who my birth parents were. So when Lisa's son suggested she take a DNA test at age 54 to find out her genetic heritage, she didn't expect it would change her life. So you take this DNA test and then you find out you have a family match. I get 
an alert and it says, this person is your uncle. So I just kind of reached out and said, if you're open to it, I would love to chat with you to see what all of this means. A few days later, they spoke on the phone. You know, my heart's like turning flips. He goes, you know, tell me about yourself. What do you know? So I said, well, I was born on December the 10th, 1964. I was told that my biological mom was very young when she had me. She moved to LA because she wanted to be in Hollywood. And then he just stopped me right there. So then I'm thinking, okay, here it comes. He's gonna say, don't ever call me again. He goes, Lisa, you're my niece. We've been looking for you. We've all been looking for you. And the surprises didn't stop there. I say, well, where is my mother? He goes, oh, she lives in LA. And I went, oh my God, because so do I. I Google her on my computer and her picture pops up. I just could not believe it. Like for the first time ever, other than looking at my son, for the first time, I'm looking at somebody who looks like me. Five minutes later, Lisa got another call. A voice on the other end says, is this my daughter? Oh. And, and then I just went, oh my God, is this my mother? She goes, yes, sweetie, this is your mom. It was just the most indescribable feeling. I'm talking to my mother. Like I'm, I'm talking to my mother. After more than 50 years of separation, Lisa and her mother, Lynn Moody, didn't waste any time making plans. She goes, well, when can I see you? And I'm like, whenever you want, right? <laughs> and she goes, how about tomorrow? For Lynn, who never had more children, it was a reunion she dreamed of, but never expected. So when <laughs> she was born, they covered my face, my eyes, so that I couldn't see her, but I could hear her cry. All I could say was, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, baby, I'm sorry. And as a mother, you never, ever, ever forget during those 50 years, all I did was try to learn how to live with it. I didn't know if she was hungry, if she was alive, if she was happy, if she was adopted. When I found out that she was my daughter, at that moment, it was like I was giving birth because I lost my legs. I was on the floor in a fetal position, screaming and crying. So I didn't know how deep that hole was. I didn't know how deep that hole was. Not only did Lynn finally have her daughter, she learned she had a grandson too. <laughs> <laughs> and in a final twist, fit for Hollywood, Lisa discovered she'd actually grown up watching her actress mother on TV. I grew up watching my mother on TV and didn't even know it. So that is insane. So that's my mama. That was our must-see TV. We all sat down and watched That's My Mama every week. And who knew? No idea. And you know, it's like, I would show That's My Mama. And then like, and That's My Mama. <laughs> Especially yeah. around Mother's Day. What would your takeaway be for, for someone? Life is full of surprises sometimes. So hang in there no matter what your circumstances are. Be open to miracles. Be open to surprises. Keep the faith. So what's going on, our Today All Day friends? We're so happy that you're here because now it is official. It's Friday. Friday. Uh, we got a great show. Told you it was catching on. We have a great show. By the way, if you're just tuning in, let us tell you about Today in 30. It's a showcase of the top segments across all four hours of our show. We do it in 30 minutes because 29 wasn't as catchy. No, no. And look how easy. Bite-sized 30 minutes. So what do you say we get you started, Savannah? We'll start in Miami. The search for survivors in that terrifying building collapsed. We're going to bring you the latest from the scene there. Plus, Craig introduces us to a new police training academy, and it's seeking to create a change from the inside. And then meet the fastest.